proof. Just to prove it's a real lab. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh. <laughs> and just, I mean, just in case you want to look, peers, Andrew, whatever, I've made a couple of small changes to the timings on the web, on the schedule for the yeah. next. Just to prove it's a real lab. <laughs> yes. Okay, now we should be live streaming. Yeah, we're live streaming now. Okay, and yesterday I lost the recording, but let's hope it works today. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. Masaki is joining us. I think he's in, are you in Madrid today, Masaki? Yes. Hello, this in Germany. Germany. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm going to turn on the recording since we're at 58. Record on this computer. Let's hope it works today. Andrew, I think the easiest way is when you ask people to give a round of applause, ask everyone to turn on their video as well, okay? Right, at that particular point. Okay. Adroja is giving us a nice view of the back of his computer. <laughs> Apparently the emails I sent out yesterday uh, didn't get through to everyone. Uh, um, let me put in the live streaming link for everyone. Is Gunnar not about today? Yeah, I don't see him. Cool. I put the live streaming link up. Steve, thank you for the uh, note. Uh, I, I put the live streaming up. So, Piers, I was talking about the email. I've, yes. I've in an email every morning, but not this morning about the live streaming. Yes, I, I, I sent uh, one entitled Day 7 Condensed Match in All the Cities last night to the, to the uh, list server, but maybe it didn't go out to everyone. It might have. I think Gunnar's been sending a separate email with the live streaming, which I don't think he's done today yet. Okay, uh, well, it, the live streaming was on yeah. that link, that email I sent yesterday. Oh yes, I'm sorry, I got it. Good, good, okay. Yeah. Good, okay, well, uh, since before I hand over to Andrew Ho to start things today, can I invite everyone to turn on their videos and we'll take a, we'll take a screenshot. <clears throat> now better like this. Look at that, it's astonishing. All right, let's try that one. I'll try, I'll just take a few more, one second. Well, it all comes up. 
Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. Look at all these wonderful people. Okay, uh, I'm handing over to, to you now, Andrew. It's all in your hands. You have to unmute. Okay, excellent. Let's start. So today we're fortunate to have Rosa to start off today's proceedings. Rosa did her PhD at University of Barcelona and then a habilitation at Dortmund before uh, arriving at um, Institute of Theoretical Physics uh, at University of Frankfurt, becoming a full professor uh, 10 years ago. So one of the main interests, one of her main interests is in the theoretical physics of frustrated magnetism and then quantum spin liquid in real materials that form correlated electron systems. Uh, but I also noticed just now that in her publication, she also has done some COVID modeling. So maybe she could tell us a bit during the break about that too. Anyway, today she's going to give us an overview of Kitaev models and their potential realization in materials. Uh, over to you, Rosa. Thank you very much. Let me just uh, share the screen um, and see whether, okay, you see my, you see my uh, uh, slides. So first of all, I would like to thank, uh, thank you for the introduction and uh, thank the organizers for this opportunity to, to talk and discuss with such an international uh, audience. And um, I realized that my title is very ambitious. So Kitaev Models and Materials, where are we now? Um, this is a, in fact a field that has been going on now for about 10 years. And to do a summary of the whole field is not possible in an hour. Um, but what I would like to do is to start with an introduction and then um, go on to a specific aspects that, uh, from my point of view, are challenging and are still puzzling nowadays. And um, a part of it, you see it here in this uh, picture where I'm showing um, ruthenium trichloride and graphene. So, uh, the end of my talk, I will be talking about this type of uh, systems. Um, before starting, of course, I would first like to uh, acknowledge my collaborators. Without them, um, none of this work would have been possible. So they are essential for the work I will be presenting. So first of all, uh, my group in Frankfurt, David Kaip, Steve Winter, who just moved to a new position in the States, Kira Riedel and Sananda Biswas, and Ying Li, who also moved to a new position in um, China. Uh, we have been also uh, collaborating with Johannes Knoller at, uh, in Munich now, and the experimental uh, group in Augsburg from Philipp Gegenbart, Alexander Zierling, and Sebastian Bach, of course. But these are not the only collaborators that I would really like to acknowledge. There, there is a long list uh, also with um, colleagues I've been discussing to and uh, I just wanted to uh, say that without all these discussions and exchange of ideas, uh, this work wouldn't have been possible. So I just wanted to, to thank many of you. So let me start um, by uh, introduction, an introduction to the Kitaev model. So the field of Kitaev started when uh, Kitaev proposed what we now know as the Kitaev model, which is in principle a very simple Hamiltonian. So this is a bond-depending Eisen model nearest, with nearest neighbor interaction on a honeycomb lattice. And what is special about this uh, Eisen model is this bond dependence. So if we go through um, the hexagon, in the, for instance, in the Z bond, we will have a Z as Z interaction in the X bond as X as X and in the Y bond as Y as Y interaction. So this model, introduces a uh, high frustration in the system. And this we can just uh, see that by putting ourselves in one side. So here we have a spin that has to interact with the nearest neighbor sites with a different spin component. And since the spin components don't commute with each other, this introduces a large frustration into the system. This model is um, nevertheless exactly solvable and the ground state is a Z2 spin liquid with gapless Majorana fermions and static gap fluxes. So let me just show you um, briefly how this exact solution goes. So what Alexei Kitayev did is to use the representation of spin operators in terms of Majorana 
fermions. And Majorana fermions, these are fermions who uh, the particle is the same as the antiparticle. And uh, now by defining four different Majorana fermions that we call here the beta gamma, so beta x, beta y, uh, b, sorry, b x, b e, b y, and b z, and c, um, we can now define, in fact, our Hamiltonian that we had originally in terms of this um, combination of uh, four different Majorana fermions. And now, when we look at, in fact, at this, um, this form of the Hamiltonian, what we observe is that these B entities, which are, in, when, when we um, get them into this, um, uh, into this product, that these are, in fact, localized entities, that they don't interact with other entities um, of the same type in the hexagon. So these are, in fact, constants of motion. And because they are constants of motion, the Hamiltonian then um, becomes a, a Hamiltonian in a quadratic form that we know very well how to diagonalize that. So once we have the Hamiltonian in this quadratic form, the um, one can obtain exactly the ground state and the excitations. And here I'm showing the phase diagram by considering different values of these coupling constants uh, K. So if we are in the case that Kx, Ky, and Kz are the same, the ground state is a gapless spin liquid. And um, when we apply, and this is going to be important for um, what I'm going to um, talk about in the next slides, when we apply a magnetic field, this um, system becomes gapped and the excitation become non-abelian. And this, of course, it's a set of exotic states that are extremely interesting if we were to realize them in materials. And this is, in fact, how um, the question started um, some years ago, whether it would be possible to have a realization of this model in real materials. And in 2000, um, and before I go to how this is constructed, let us put this Hamiltonian into the context of uh, typical Hamiltonians that we know for quantum magnets. So basically, um, what we expect in a quantum magnet as interactions are, uh, and here I'm considering only the bilinear interactions, so we will expect to have isotropic exchange. Um, we may have a jalojinsky moria term, which corresponds to the um, a vector product of the spin operators. And we may also have a symmetric term, which, where a gamma is uh, the symmetric tensor. So if we now want to impose in our quantum magnet to um, be described by only uh, this uh, Kitayev interaction that I was showing to you, it means to impose that all exchange uh, terms disappear, so are zero. The jalojinsky moria contributions should be zero. Most of the matrix elements of the symmetric term should be zero. And the only terms that remain are the diagonal uh, terms in this uh, gamma symmetric tensor, but with a dependence on the orientation of the bond, because um, as it is defined the Kitayev model, it has this bond dependence. So this seems like um, a very difficult um, set of conditions to fulfill in a material, um, but it's not. And uh, this is in fact a, a very nice work um, by, uh, by George Jacqueli and Guinea Kaliulin in 2009 where um, in fact they did this step of showing how can one engineer this type of interaction into a material. So what they proposed is the following. So because we need uh, in fact to have, in this case, I'm talking about SU2 spins. Um, so we need to have them bond dependent. We would need um, the effect of spin orbit coupling so therefore, we're going to think about heavy transitional metal ions, which are in a um, D5 configuration for the following reason. So let me go through the process step by step. 
So um, we need a D5 configuration, but in an octahedral environment. So that means transitional metal ions with an octahedral environment, because then we will have a splitting of the D levels into lower T2G and higher EG levels. Um, this occupation five, it means five electrons in the T2G levels. If we now have that uh, the, uh, uh, this is a heavy ion, so spin orbit coupling is important, the spin orbit coupling does a further splitting of these levels into J effective three half and J effective one half. So this is, we can call then a pseudo spin. Now the occupation of five brings us into the single occupied state um, in, in this uh, J effective one half state. If we now consider that our systems, we're talking about D electrons are uh, correlated, a Coulomb um, repulsion will then bring my system into a J effective one half mod insulator. So this was the first step. We do have now the entities that um, this J effective, as you can see here is a representation of one of them, is a linear combination of my T2G orbitals with a certain component of spin. So it's a, it's a complex uh, uh, linear combination that has then this um, property of having a spin orbit entanglement. So once we have now these entities, let's see how we construct the interactions. So the idea now is to take these um, octahedra and couple them via H sharing. And the idea behind that is because if we couple them via H sharing, we will have that the exchange interactions that are um, given through uh, the hybridization with the ligand, they are destructively, um, in fact, um, they are destructing their effect and therefore, effectively, we will have that the exchange interaction is zero. If moreover, now, these um, octahedra are, um, have, are building a lattice with inversion symmetry, like the honeycomb lattice, then the jalginsky moria terms are going to be zero, and a few of the gamma uh, terms belonging to the symmetric tensor are also going to be zero. And now what remains here, oops, pardon, what remains here is basically the interactions um, between the J effective one half pseudo spin via the J effective three half states. And this interaction, so this is a virtual process, is happening because of the Huns coupling that we have between this J effective one half pseudo spins and the JZ. Um, plus minus three half um, of these states here. And this is nothing else as an Ising type of interaction. So now we do have in this design, um, a realization of the Kitaev uh, model where now we even know in fact this K, what is dependent on. So it is dependent on the Huns coupling, the hopping parameter, it's dependent on the correlation U and on the um, spin orbit coupling. So basically the scales of my problem. So once we have that, and once this paper, in fact, this suggestion came out, um, it was then um, a fast race to find materials that fulfill this kind of conditions. And here I'm showing two of them the, that, um, in fact, ruthenium trichloride is known since um, many decades but it was never uh, looked from this perspective. So here I'm showing two examples of um, the, uh, what we call the two dimensional Kitaev materials. So let me start with um, alpha ruthenium trichloride. So this is a system, which is a layered system of these honeycombs of ruthenium surrounded by chlorine. And these uh, layers are stacked via van der Waal forces. Another example are the so-called 213 iridates. Again, these are uh, hexagonal, um, 2D hexagonal uh, layers where in the middle we have a cation, either lithium or sodium, and then they are also stacked 
where in the between two layers of this type, we have a layer of lithium or sodium. So this um, was um, very good news. Um, however, these systems are not for not fulfilling perfectly the conditions I was showing to you. So they show trigonal distortions. Um, there are other interaction paths that are non-zero in the when the when one considers all the interactions in the system. So um, this gives rise to the fact that the description of the system is not only um, having this term surviving, the Kitaev term, but also other contributions. And um, even though in all these systems, the Kitaev contribution is the strongest one because of the presence of the other contributions that I'm going to describe um, in a moment, um, these systems in fact show at low temperatures a uh, long range magnetic order. So for instance, the examples I'm showing here, alpha ruthenium trichloride and sodium uh, iridate, they uh, show this, uh, this uh, zigzag magnetic order. The alpha lithium iridate and the 3D versions um, of the lithium iridate, they have more complex orderings, but they also order. So in fact, Jeff Rao and Hei Yong Ki were one of the first to, um, to realize that um, there would be other interactions apart from Kitaev that are important for the description of these systems. And let me show you with which interactions are those. So we have this, um, the contribution of what we call off-diagonal anisotropic interactions. So let's assume that we are in, a, in the gamma is equal to the Z bond. So if we have the S, SIZ, SJZ, um, also contributing to the interactions are the SIX, SI, um, SJY, as well as the what we call the gamma prime, which would be in this case SX, um, uh, SZ, or an XY, uh, SZ. So these terms are indeed an um, these um, are various calculations from Beispiel from Ab initio, where one can um, derive these uh, spin Hamiltonians that uh, in fact show the presence of these interactions. And um, let me tell you maybe now some words about the sign of these interactions because it's important when we analyze in fact the behavior of the systems and uh, the excitation spectrum. So what do we know about the sign of the interactions? So the, um, from up initial, if one starts from first principles, those DFT calculations, and then uses various methods to obtain these um, spin Hamiltonians, so either projective methods as we're using, or total energy methods, or a perturbation theory, one comes to the conclusion that in this material, so the chemistry, um, and now let me, um, let me concentrate on one of these materials, alpha ruthenium trichloride. So um, chemistry is telling us that this Kitaev interaction is ferromagnetic, um, while this gamma interaction is antiferromagnetic. Now, there are independent of these up initial, um, uh, up initial calculations, one can also obtain conditions on these um, coupling constants by following the experimental observations. So for instance, Chalupka and uh, Kaliulin, they in fact showed that if we know um, from experiments, the orientation of the magnetic moment in the ordered phase, this is restricting what kind of um, signs and values you can get, you, can, you have to have for these anisotropic interactions. Um, and here I'm, so for instance, um, uh, the group of Steve Nagler, they in fact measured this um, uh, ordered magnetic moment. And um, later on, this has been in fact uh, used, this is a recent work on that, that confirms also what up initial uh, calculations show that in this, ma in this material, the, um, the K, the Kita F term is ferromagnetic and gamma is antiferromagnetic. And there is a very recent work by uh, Pavel Maximos, Maximov and uh, Sasha Chernyshev where um, they concentrate on the experimental observations in ESR 
and terahertz spectroscopy at high uh, magnetic fields um, and show, in fact, that this also constrains what kind of uh, parameters uh, this uh, quantum system can be described with. So <clears throat> um, there is the positive side is that this system is a highly anisotropic concerning the interactions. The, let's say, less, uh, less uh, good news is that it's not a spin liquid in the ground state. We uh, saw last week, let me maybe uh, go once back. We saw last week, in fact, there is one system that shows no order that, uh, and Hide Takagi was, uh, in fact, um, discussing it because uh, this is a system that uh, he and his group have been working on. I won't be talking about this system today. I will um, stay first with um, the materials, uh, in fact, more concentrated on ruthenium trichloride. But if uh, time is left, we can also discuss this material. So let me now um, go and uh, try to uh, see what this complex uh, um, low, low symmetry interactions are giving us as, um, uh, in fact, how the system is behaving due, due to these um, low symmetry interactions. And um, here, what I'm showing on the, on the right side are various experimental observations. And on the left side, I'm showing uh, theoretical calculations by using this minimal model with these parameters that I was showing to you. So a Kitayev, a gamma uh, term, and then a J1 and our third neighbors uh, Heisenberg term. And these values are obtained from up initial calculations. And uh, basically what I want to show here is that the um, observed excitations in this system are extremely uh, anomalous. It's not what one expects, of course, if we had a purely Heisenberg system. So let me show you here, for instance, the neutron scattering um, data from the OC reach in the ordered phase. So one observes this around the gamma point, this would correspond to the magnon excitations, but what one observes is this strong um, continua that really is going in a very uh, large width of energies. Um, and there has been a lot of discussion whether this continua could be related to Majorana excitations. And here is how, in fact, this kind of spectra can be reproduced by this type of models. These are uh, here exact diagonalization of this model for um, large clusters. Um, in fact, just to show that this kind of models is um, uh, describing these uh, excitations. Other uh, properties, for instance, are that uh, at finite temperature, one observes that there is a lot of um, transfer of spectral weight from one K point to gamma. This is, for instance, these, these experiments by Do and collaborators. And um, this type of models at finite temperature can also describe these um, uh, spectral weight transfers. And um, what I'm going to talk now is about the effects of uh, field excitations. So in fact, um, just to um, uh, stop for a moment, um, why, uh, why we are putting so much effort in understanding this one material. Um, so the idea is the following. So one of the uh, most elusive uh, um, states in condensed matter is a spin liquid uh, state. And we saw it now with the Kitayev model that the Kitayev model, the ground state is a spin liquid, so a C2 spin liquid, but um, if one can realize this model, then in a material, then we would have uh, the realization of a spin liquid. So one of the motivations that one can uh, put oneself about these materials that are not that far away from these uh, uh, having pure Kitayev interactions is to uh, just think about what can we do to the material to shift so in this case, I'm talking about ruthenium trichloride, but it's also valid by the for the it's also valid for the two one three systems. What uh, can I do to shift the system away from the uh, six sac long range order and try to see whether we are able to reach maybe a spin liquid state? So one possibility is this is a quantum magnet, so we can manipulate a quantum magnet with a magnetic field. 
So what happens, what if we apply a magnetic field to the system, what we will expect is that at a, a critical magnetic field, we are going to suppress the, the, the long range order. And the question is whether before reaching the field polarized phase at large fields, whether there is an intermediate uh, spin liquid phase. But there is another way to manipulate the system, which is by, for instance, applying strain fields. So um, this coupling constants, so basically these constants that describe the uh, uh, spin interactions in the system are extremely dependent on, uh, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the structure of the system. And um, as I will show later, very small changes in the structure um, produce huge changes in these, um, in these coupling constants. So the question is whether by applying adequate strain fields to the system, one can then uh, bring the system near the region where the only surviving interaction would be the Kitaev interaction. And here, this is going to be uh, in the second part of my talk, I will be talking about pressure effects and effects of straining the system for instance, by building heterostructures. So here, ruthenium trichloride on graphene, which has been, in fact, experimentally realized. But <clears throat> this, um, the, feel, the, the field induced phases is indeed a fascinating um, field right now of um, discussion. So uh, I would like to start by uh, discussing what um, we know from experiments about these field induced phases. And I apologize that I won't be able to uh, show all experiments, really nice experiments on these, um, on, on uh, ruthenium trichloride on the magnetic field. I just took a choice of them, um, but I'm happy uh, to discuss because many of my colleagues are here about uh, others. So here, I, let me start by one of the very first um, experiments um, on um, uh, ruthenium trichloride on the magnetic field. And this is uh, a work done by Roger Johnson and Rado Coldea in Oxford. So basically um, they had a single crystal. And um, what I'm uh, going to show here is that, and what we are going to expect is that due to these very anisotropic spin interactions that I was commenting about ruthenium trichloride, we are going to expect very different uh, response depending on in which direction we are applying the magnetic field. So what I'm showing here is the phase diagram that uh, um, uh, Roger and Radu obtained um, for the case when the magnetic field is applied in plane. So for an in-plane magnetic field, so if when the magnetic field is zero, the system um, in fact, goes into the paramagnetic phase at 14 Kelvin. At that time, um, the single crystal had a lot of um, stacking faults. So nowadays we know that if we can, one can reduce the number of stacking faults in the sample, the uh, critical uh, temperature is then about uh, six to seven uh, Kelvin. So now um, by applying a magnetic field in plane, um, what they observe is that the uh, long range magnetic order is suppressed uh, between eight and nine Teslas. And now what I want to show here is that if we observe the um, behavior of the magnetization as a function of magnetic field for uh, by whether we apply a magnetic field parallel to the Z direction or in plane, you see how different is the response. So while in the uh, application of a magnetic field parallel to C, we are still deep into this ordered phase. The application of the in-plane magnetic field at about um, seven, eight Teslas, there is a transition from the ordered phase, and one can see it here by following the temperature behavior, um, where um, in this region, the long range order is lost. And uh, in fact, they even went to larger uh, magnetic fields, so up to 60 Teslas. And what uh, I would like to show here is that even at very high, at these very high fields, the system doesn't reach saturation. And we would expect that because of these 
anisotropic um, uh, contributions so that it's very, one has to go to really large fields to saturate um, the magnetization. So these were um, one of the first experiments showing the behavior of the system on the magnetic field. And what I'm showing here is in order to have an idea of this strong anisotropy, I'm showing, I'm showing now um, a phase diagram. This is at t equals zero of the ground state of the system as a function of um, magnetic field by considering the magnetic field um, from in plane out of plane, so zero degrees out of plane 90 degrees and back to in plane. Just to show you how the ground state is um, the zigzag uh, uh, long range order is extremely dependent on, um, in fact, in which orientation we are with the applied magnetic field. So when we are here in plane, again, the zigzag long range order is lost at about eight to 10, so eight, six, seven, uh, eight Teslas, while for um, a magnetic field perpendicular to the plane of the system, one has to go to very high fields to um, start um, uh, suppressing the long range order. So- Question? Yes. Rosa, can I yes. ask a question? Yeah, can you uh, tell us uh, whether at these high fields you're approaching the point where the J equals one half and three halves are starting to mix? Well, okay. How, how do the fields compare with this, the splitting of the, those two multiples? That's, the multiple that's a very good question, since um, indeed now what I'm showing here is uh, in fact assuming now basically the pure uh, one half. Uh, um, so, so I'm doing these simulations with a purely J effective one half uh, system. Um, mm -hmm. When uh, indeed, this is uh, a very uh, important question. When you are at these very large uh, scales, then you have also to take into account the effect of the three halves. So this is an important point. Um, but this is not going to, um, to suppress when you, um, when you, so this is not going to necessarily suppress your zigzag order. So still you have to go to very high fields, but yes, one has to consider then these degrees of freedom. This um, is you. a simplification that we do in the model. <laughs> So, so what I um, my uh, what I want to show you with this uh, phase diagram, uh, which is obtained by by these anisotropic models, is where are we now? So, all the experimental discussion, because what um, as I was trying to motivate, the question is um, whether when we suppress the, this uh, long range zigzag order, whether there is an intermediate spin liquid uh, region before reaching the um, polarized uh, phase. So all the experimental discussion, discussion is in this region because these are also the available uh, magnetic fields. These are more available magnetic fields in the lab. However, the, um, the, uh, there is a lot of development on the theoretical side to propose, um, and in fact, a lot of interesting um, spin liquid phases when the magnetic field is applied perpendicular to the plane, which would mean for the experimentalists uh, to go to these really high magnetic fields. And these, I'm just showing here a choice of them that um, if you include to your Hamiltonian, not only the Kita F term, but also this gamma and gamma primes term that I was uh, saying they are necessary to describe the system, then you get a very interesting phases um, here uh, with these orientations of the magnetic fields. But up to now, none of the, um, none of the um, models that have been uh, analyzed shows an intermediate um, spin liquid phase for in-plane um, fields, except if we consider that we have the pure Kitaev model. So let me now go um, and try to um, guide you through um, what, what is there about the experimental, uh, what the experimental um, features are when we are in this region. And then we will um, see uh, how we deal with that. So here I'm showing, and so now I'm concentrating 
because of this strong anisotropy, where I apply a field um, a parallel to A or B or perpendicular, I'm going for the for the for the rest of the time. I'm going to concentrate on experiments that consider an in-plane magnetic field along the A direction, and we call the A direction the direction which is perpendicular to the ruthenium ruthenium bonds. And here, um, let me show the um, a very nice experiment, also again by the group of Oak Ridge, um, where they show here susceptibility uh, measurements for this in-plane uh, magnetic field along the A direction. And basically the susceptibility shows two peaks, um, let's call it BC1 and BC2, which uh, in fact correspond, and this uh, we can see it in the next, so these peaks correspond to a phase transition, the first one from an antiferromagnetic um, phase, the zigzag phase, to a second uh, antiferromagnetic phase. Let me show that in the next slide. So here is, um, in fact, also from Oak Ridge Group, an analysis of uh, this region. Let me, start, let me first start with this region where we saw this, um, uh, the behavior of the susceptibility. So what it seems to happen um, when you apply the magnetic field, um, that there is at these values of magnetic field between six and seven, there is a change um, of the Q vector uh, of the ordering Q vector from a, a zigzag that uh, they call it one to a zigzag two phase. And these are in fact what um, the fact that there is this, two trend, this, this first transition would correspond to this BC uh, antiferromagnetic one and the second transition corresponds to the full suppression of the long range order. The experiments that are shown here are magnetocaloric effect experiments, susceptibility experiments, neutron diffraction experiments, these are these three points, and uh, inelastic uh, um, neutron scattering. So basically what um, these uh, measurements show is um, that uh, after suppressing the long range order, um, the region of the field polarized, so when they observe clearly the, um, the, uh, the one magnon state corresponding to the field polarized um, corresponds to this region here. And then the question is, of course, whether in between, in this region here, there could still be a, a spin liquid um, phase surviving. So this is um, basically now um, corresponding to these measurements. But now let me show you the measurements that have been um, really um, uh, very uh, important in this, um, in this field, which is uh, the thermal hall conductivity measurements from the group of Yuji Matsuda in um, Tokyo. And I'm showing here the most recent experiments because um, in this uh, case, um, for these measurements they are considering the application of the magnetic field along the A direction, which is what I'm trying now to concentrate on, only the field in one uh, given direction. So um, these, the thermal hall uh, conductivity measurements, the idea is to measure the heat current perpendicular to an applied um, temperature gradient under the application of a magnetic field. And what they observe is that for a magnetic field applied along the A direction, there is um, a region uh, of the um, thermal hall conductivity, which is this region here between 10 and 11 uh, Teslas, where the value of the thermal hall conductivity is quantized at a value, and this is the value in this one half of this unit, is precisely the quantization that is predicted um, if we consider the KITIF model and we apply a magnetic field. So this will give rise to a chiral spin liquid, a gapped chiral spin liquid with uh, fractionalized excitations and therefore this quantization. Um, if the magnetic field is applied along the B direction, there is no quantization. So this has been in fact a subject of uh, long and is a subject of long discussions. 
Um, since now, uh, let me show you a couple more of experiments about the thermal hall conductivity because um, of the following. So in the, considering now this uh, experiment here, the corresponding phase diagram that is also shown by the authors for uh, the case of um, the system is the following. So there's the, the zigzag order um, is suppressed at about uh, seven Teslas, like we know here also from, um, from other uh, experiments. But they seem to find this um, quantization at larger magnetic fields. So as if there were a spin liquid, the spin liquid would be not um, raising uh, after the, the suppression of the long range order, but uh, at some fields further away. And moreover, there is um, another study by members of, uh, so by uh, co-authors of this uh, work, where they find, in fact, a very important sample dependence of this uh, quantized thermal conductivity. So here, for instance, I'm showing uh, the results with uh, a given sample uh, of the quantization, while um, um, previous um, results from uh, Yuji uh, Matsuda group show the quantization to happen here at this region of magnetic fields. And in this recent work, the quantization is at much larger magnetic fields. So there is still here um, something to be understood, um, why there is the sample dependence. And um, what uh, I think it's important is, it seems that in all these samples, the suppression of the long range order is happening at the same uh, field. However, this uh, quantized um, state appears in different range of fields, depending on the sample. So um, for instance, considering this case, we would be, and here I'm showing another um, experiment. So for, these are Raman experiments um, from the group of Peter Lehmanns, also the group of um, Paul van Lostrich, uh, has performed um, Raman on the magnetic field and the results are very similar. So in this region, we are in the gap region where there is a clear presence of um, this magnon, magnon corresponding to the uh, polarized field polarized phase. So there is here a question about um, how what is happening in this system. So. In principle, we would have two scenarios, uh, depending on which, uh, which um, measurement we are looking at. One scenario would be that after suppression of the long range zigzag order, um, the, the system has, here is a quantum critical point, and then there is an adiabatic uh, going, so the, the, this continues adiabatically into the field polarized phase without um, a true intermediate phase. The second scenario, which um, is the scenario that these thermal hall conductivity measurements um, in fact seem to show is um, that after suppressing the long range magnetic order, there is an intermediate spin liquid phase, which is in fact described by the Kitayev um, spin liquid and then at some uh, larger uh, magnetic field, we should go into the field polarized phase. So the question that we posed ourselves is the following. So if whatever of these two scenarios is happening in thermodynamics, we should be seeing um, in fact these phase transitions. So if we assume that we have an intermediate spin liquid phase, uh, of the kind that these quantized thermal hall conductivity are showing, it means that this is a topologically non-trivial phase. Um, while the ordered uh, zigzag um, magnetism is a topologically trivial phase and the same for the field polarized phase. So we expect that thermodynamically, we are going to expect to see phase transitions. So one here and one here. So this is why we decided um, together with our colleagues in, um, 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 in uh, so Philip Gegenbart and collaborators to look at thermodynamics. And what exactly question? we are going to look. So we are going to look at the magnetic Grüneisen parameter. So the Grüneisen parameter- question, please? Yes. Sorry, thank you. Um, 
Yeah, it's just on the previous slide. Um, I'm just very curious why, if there's an intermediate spin liquid phase, it should be described by the Kitayev model because the symmetries look to be very different. Well, that's, that's one of the puzzles that we don't understand. We really don't understand um, why. That's, that's exactly the point. While um, many of us uh, have been trying to uh, find models where um, we include not only the spin, uh, the, the Kitayev interactions, but also the other interactions that we know are important in order to see whether we can uh, find this phase. And um, that's the problem. The models don't show the appearance of this phase. And this is a puzzle. So right now we don't understand that because as you, uh, as you say, this, um, this quantization that um, is, is uh, observed in uh, Tokyo, this is the quantization predicted for the pure Kitayev model. So it's a puzzle. Okay, That's, thank you. Yeah. So let's look at thermodynamics. And um, last week, uh, Premi uh, Chandra, she introduced the, the Grun Eisen parameter as a very sensitive uh, thermodynamic um, measurement to, in fact, track. Uh, quantum phase transitions. And um, what I'm going to talk uh, today is um, about the magnetic Grunison parameter in order to be able to track the possible uh, phase transitions in the system on the magnetic field. So how do we define the, uh, the magnetic Grunison parameter? So it's given by the ratio of the uh, derivative of the magnetization with respect to the temperature and the specific heat. So if we now observe, um, look at um, the specific heat behavior as a function of magnetic field at a given temperature, this is two Kelvin. What one observes in the specific heat and the magnetic field here is applied uh, not exactly along the A direction. So it seems it's very difficult to align these samples. It has um, uh, an, a, a misalignment of about 10 degrees. So what um, specific heat shows is um, there is a, an anomaly at this BC uh, that we call BCAF1 at about six Kelvin. And there is a second very um, a strong anomaly at BCAF2, which would correspond to these two phases that um, were also seen in um, susceptibility measurements. Now, if we look at the, um, at the Grunison parameter, and that's why it's such a sensitive probe, one observes that at uh, this uh, first um, uh, anomaly in the specific heat, there is a clear um, maximum here. And this is um, indicating that uh, probably this, um, this um, phase transition this, between these two magnetic states is of weak first order. And then we have a clear um, second order phase transition where the Grunison parameter is changing sign. And this corresponds to the phase transition between um, suppressing the long range order in the system. And what this um, uh, analysis of the Grunison parameter shows is a shoulder. This shoulder here um, that um, the sh the sh we, we call the shoulder at B star, which is about 10 Tesla. And I will be trying to discuss about this shoulder in a moment. If we take the shoulder seriously, what could the shoulder tell us about the system on the field? So if we now, now go back to- uh, Rosa, Rosa, Rosa. Yes. Rosa. yes. Sorry? There's a question, a question from Mazaki Oshikawa. There's a okay. question from Mazaki Oshikawa. He says, could you, could you remind us the experimental evidence that the region B antiferromagnetic C1 uh, less than B antiferromagnetic C2 still has yes. the antiferromagnetic long range order? Oh, yes, yes. Um, these are the experiments. And maybe, um, in fact, Steve Nagel is here. He can comment, oh, sorry. He can comment on these experiments. These are uh, Steve's experiments. Yeah, I, I can say uh, what, what isn't here, uh, there's actually a neutron diffraction that shows precisely what this is. So what's labeled ZZ1 is zigzag in the plane with a three layer stacking. 
And what's labeled ZZ2 is zigzagging the plane with a six layer stacking. And we know this from diffraction that uh, it's been circulated a bit, but it's unpublished. And uh, we, we also know the dependence of those boundaries on the orientation of the field in the plane. So when the field's along B, they're very close together, perhaps merged. When the field is perpendicular to the bond, you see the maximum split, which is shown here. So Thank I you. hope that answers it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, okay. More questions? Okay. So let me continue on uh, now um, analyzing these phase transitions. Um, first of all, because we are the theories and we always look whether we um, can get with these, um, in fact, this type of spin models that we saw that can, can describe quite a lot of the experiments, where, whether we can also explain um, the behavior of the Grüneisen parameter. Here I'm showing the experiment and here I'm showing the theoretical results and uh, a couple of disclaimers. Uh, of course, we, and uh, Steve, thanks for the uh, explanation. Steve showed that for this phase transition, you need to consider three dimensional uh, long range order. Um, our model is now for a 2D system. So we are not going to be able to describe this phase transition, but definitely we are describing the phase transition when the, when the long range order is suppressed. Um, the calculations show a much more smeared out behavior due to the fact that these are exact diagonalization on finite clusters, and therefore there is a finite size effect. But what this model don't show is this type of shoulder. So we then um, decided to say, okay, let's forget about the models for the moment, and let's try to um, understand what uh, a Grunison, a shoulder in a Grunison parameter, what kind of information this can tell us, especially if it's a shoulder that it's clearly not indicating a phase transition. So um, what we did, and this um, is, uh, I have to here mention David Kipe, a PhD in Frankfurt, who, who worked out all, all, all these uh, thermodynamics. So let's have a look at the Grunison parameter here, lambda, it can be uh, P if it's the volume Grunison parameter, or it can be B if it's uh, the magnetic Grunison parameter. I will be here staying with the magnetic Grunison parameter. So if we do the limit of the Grunison parameter at t equals zero, basically um, for a system that has a gap, delta, basically the Grunison parameter can be written as uh, the derivative of uh, delta as a function of the parameter, in this case is a magnetic field, divided by the, um, uh, the gap. So if we now, with this expression, we can analyze a first order phase transition given by a level crossing, we get uh, indeed the Grunison parameter gives the, the uh, behavior that one uh, expects, which is corresponds to this um, to this uh, 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 to this divergence um, here at the at the level crossing, and for the case of a continuous quantum phase transition, then the Grunison parameter will show this change of sign. So um, what we can now can um, uh, explore is well, let's consider about um, the behavior of the lowest excitation. So we could have at finite fields that um, at some given field, um, we could have the crossing of excitations coming from neighbor, um, neighbor phases in the system. So competing phases in the system. So here I'm showing that pictorically. So in the case that I have um, crossing of low lying excitations coming from different K vectors, for instance, if I'm considering ordered states, this automatically gives in the Grunison parameter a step behavior, which at finite temperature will be a shoulder behavior. Um, while this is the specific heat doesn't show any sign of this effect here. So um, indeed here, this kind of behavior is telling us that the Grunison parameter can show a shoulder when we have crossing of lowest excitation coming from, from different competing states, near states that are nearby. 
Let me show you a ca case one. So when one take for the description of the uh, ruthenium trichloride, a more complete model than um, these uh, five parameters that I was showing to you. In fact, what we find at finite field is that there is a crossing of, um, of two uh, low, um, low lying excited states corresponding in fact to a different case. So this would be the zigzag order and this could be the ferromagnetic order. And this would give, um, in fact, after suppressing the long range um, uh, order would give this kind of shoulder. Or a more exotic case is we do have um, um, for the case of the, I don't know how my time is doing. How much is my time? Um, you've done Sorry. one now. Almost one hour, so we we uh, expect to be getting into a, a question time in let's say five ten minutes. Is that okay. possible? Okay, because uh, I wanted to show uh, the graphene. So so let me just um, this more exotic. So I wanted to go to the strain uh, case. So if you give me six minutes, that should should be fine. So sure. um, basically, a more exotic uh, uh, case would be the following. So we know that the antiferromagnetic KTF uh, model has in fact um, very interesting phases. So um, in the antiferromagnetic KTF, the spin, the, the KTF spin liquid in fact survives for larger values of magnetic field. And there is a second uh, spin liquid phase which is uh, called a U1 um, spin liquid. Now, what we know for, um, from uh, this work from Chalupka and uh, Giniat is that if we apply uh, hidden, the hidden symmetries, if we apply these symmetries to uh, the antiferromagnetic KTIF model, in fact, we have that this model is equivalent to a ferromagnetic uh, KTIF model plus other interactions, so gamma, gamma, uh, gamma and J interactions. And this model, in fact, is rather near in parameters to the model of the ruthenium trichloride. So what I want to say here is that um, such a phase, if it's nearby um, the, uh, the if, if ruthenium trichloride has such a phase nearby competing with the state of the ruthenium trichloride, once we go to a field where the zigzag order is suppressed, then um, one may get this shoulder in the um, Grunison parameter due to the fact that there is a nearby phase where the system never enters to it, but it feels the excitations of this phase. So um, concluding this uh, part, and then the, the next five minutes, I will talk uh, about a uh, strain. Concluding this part, um, if we take this shoulder seriously, uh, and in fact, other measurements, so for instance, in magnetostriction, also shoulders have been uh, reported uh, at this range of magnetic fields. Um, what uh, we propose that these shoulders uh, are describing is the presence of nearby competing phases without the system really going into this competing phase. And of course, the big question is, which is the relation to the thermal hall conductivity measurements? And this is something that needs to be explored. So let me now in my last five minutes, just tell you um, shortly about um, what happens with the strain fields. And as I was telling to you, um, the uh, exchange parameters are extremely dependent on, uh, in fact, the hybridizations that you have in the system. And just to show here, if we change a little bit this um, angle between these, uh, these two ruthenium atoms, then we can, we can have very strong changes on the uh, interactions as a function of this angle. So that means that if we apply uh, pressure or strain, we are going to be able to manipulate these interactions. What does pressure do, which is um, the first experiment that was done. So uh, Rosa, sorry, sorry to interrupt, there is a um, question about two slides ago. Yes, let me go From back. From Yasha. This one? Uh, uh, Yasha, can you uh, unmute yourself? Uh, yeah, I, so uh, my question was that the, the, the shoulder in the experiment seems to be horizontal, rather a plateau, whereas your, uh, your phenomenological uh, 
finite energy crossing gave vertical shoulders. So can you comment about it? Is it possible to get this plateaus out of those kind of models? Okay, so our explanation of this is in fact uh, a smearing of temperature. So if I, of course, the, 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 the basically this, um, this very strong um, uh, step is because it, it was a t equals zero um, calculation, but as soon as you um, go to higher temperatures, you start smearing out. Um, that's, of course, one can now try to analyze further and perfection that. Um, this was now done uh, by considering a simple crossing of two, um, of two levels. Uh, we know that, of course, we do have uh, this continua of excitations. You have to then improve on this model. And probably then one can make a better quantitative um, uh, explanation of, of this shoulder. Thank you. So, um, so pressure, applying pressure on ruthenium trichloride. Uh, here, what I'm showing is the optical conductivity measurements of the phonons. And these are the uh, in-plane phonons. So what pressure does to the system basically is that it distorts the system. So at a critical pressure of about 1.9 gigapascals, the system distorts and basically um, it forms a static uh, state of uh, spin uh, singlets. So therefore no chance here to get a spin liquid. Um, and now I come to my last two minutes, um, going back to my first slide about what happens when uh, ruthenium trichloride is uh, put on top of graphene. And here I'm mentioning two experiments on that. One is done in Washington University in St. Louis, um, Zoo and collaborators. And the other one was done in um, uh, Stuttgart at the Max Planck Institute. So um, I'm showing here the construction at the Max Planck Institute. So basically um, they put um, graphene uh, and ruthenium, uh, then a top layer of hexagonal boronitride and uh, the, the device uh, in order to measure transport is just basically um, put together with these uh, gold um, contacts. So with that, they could then measure um, resistivity in the system. And here I'm showing um, as a function of volt uh, voltage, what they observe is uh, basically the, the conductivity. What they observe is that by doing this construction, ruthenium trichloride on graphene, there is an uh, increase in the, so there is a better conduction uh, in graphene and there is a charge transfer. And the question is what happens with this charge transfer? Um, here I'm showing um, uh, the Hassmann alpha oscillations and the corresponding Fourier transform of the magneto resistant that clearly shows as a function of temperature, the presence of two um, whole pockets, of two pockets. I mean, I will show that these whole pockets, two whole pockets in the system so that the system is conducting. What is interesting is that uh, the temperature evolution of this uh, fast Fourier transform um, is non-monotonic. And this is also telling us something about the system. So uh, Sananda Visbas uh, basically did many um, uh, simulations on uh, heterostructures of ruthenium trichloride on graphene in order to be able to analyze these experiments. And uh, these are some examples, but basically the um, heterostructure that has lower energy is this hexagonal cell. And as you see, there is a strong um, mismatch between the lattice parameters of the graphene and of the ruthenium trichloride. So that means that putting ruthenium trichloride on graphene is a straining ruthenium trichloride. And what is happening then is that um, when, by doing this construction, uh, there is a charge transfer from the graphene to the ruthenium trichloride. So the graphene becomes whole dope. That's why the conductivity um, gets uh, higher. And this is, you see it here, it becomes whole dope. And these bands here are the bands of the ruthenium. So um, what is happening then? And the question is, why is this anomalous behavior as a function of temperature of um, the uh, fast Fourier transform of the magnetoresistance? And there are two scenarios. One is 
at this temperature, ruthenium trichloride orders. So it could be, uh, oops, it could be the spin scattering um, effects, or it could be the fact that we have a flat band that is hybridizing with, um, this is a flat band basically hybridizing with um, uh, graphene. So um, what uh, we then um, found out is that uh, this tensile strain applied on ruthenium trichloride enhances the Kitaev interactions and reduces, in fact, these other anisotropic interactions that um, are, uh, in, that are, let's say, the interactions that you wouldn't like if you want to bring the system into the spin liquid phase. And moreover, what we have here now is a doped Kitaev um, uh, system because of this charge transfer from the graphene, graphene so that we would be done um, describing the behavior of the system in terms of such a Hamiltonian. And now this is really my last slide. What I'm showing here is basically a phase diagram of this um, doped uh, uh, Kitaev, uh, Kita so uh, doped Kitaev uh, model. Here it's a phase diagram by Hiart and collaborators, where um, it's interesting to see that if we just put here the parameters of this uh, ruthenium trichloride on graphene, we are in this region where the system could even show um, a kind of unconventional superconductivity. So here is my last slide um, where I would uh, like to conclude that um, the I hope that I could show you a little bit um, why uh, these uh, Kitaev models and materials are interesting. Uh, where are our puzzles um, right now uh, in this field induced phases, trying to understand um, the fact that uh, all uh, experiments don't really agree in um, basically what is the behavior that is happening in this intermediate region. And we, we need to uh, really try to develop more um, ideas on that. So there is very recent uh, ideas by uh, Hei Young, uh, Ki, where uh, she proposes to uh, look at uh, torque, in-plane torque, uh, maybe to see some of these effects. And on the other hand, there is also a whole field uh, to explore by considering this type of heterostructure. So combining Kitaev physics with uh, graphene physics. And with that, I would like to thank for, thank you for your attention and I'm uh, happy to answer your questions. Okay, let's unmute and uh, clap for a um, uh, really great talk. <laughs> questions? You can either uh, raise your hand or uh, put down something in the chat, please. Um, okay, so the first one I get is from Stephen Nagler. Yeah, hi, it was a great talk. Um, I have a question about the B star observed in the Grunizen uh, experiments. Um, you showed data at two Kelvin. Is there a temperature dependence on B star? Yes, is there known? is. In fact, it, at, at higher temperatures, it disappears. And so, at lower temperatures, does it reduce or does it? Uh... No, it's stronger. So low, well, okay, they, they only went on to two Kelvin. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the data that uh, I can, I, I showed you. So I don't know, they, they need to go to uh, lower temperatures to see whether, um, how, how this gets stronger. I mean, I was trying- I guess to... I was wondering if the, if the field varies in the same way as it seems to in the magnetocaloric effect. Uh, yeah, good point, because you did these measurements of the magnetocaloric effect, right? Yes. Um, and uh, the thing is that um, talking to them, they say that, okay, they have this pure, this, this perfect adiabatic conditions by, um, by doing these measurements. So I don't know how they compare with your uh, wrapping up and down um, of the magnetic field, but mm. this is uh, a question, in fact, for, for Philip. This I don't know. All right, thanks. Okay, the next question from Liang Wu. Liang, can you uh, unmute yourself? Great. Sure. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, so hi, Harold. I have a question. Hi. 
the, the U1, U1 uh, spring liquid picture you proposed. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes. So, right. So, so here, so uh, I'm curious. So here the little edge is also the field, right? The field direction. Um, okay, so here what I'm what what the so here what I'm showing is now these are the exact analyzation calculations. Are you asking about here or are you asking so the, the, about the, the, the right the, the right phase diagram? There is a oh edge. okay. So this phase diagram is a phase diagram where um, as a function of an in-plane magnetic field, um, what we have in this axis is at this edge, we do have this H tilde, which basically has exactly the same phase diagram as the antiferromagnetic Kitayev. And here we have the, um, the Hamiltonian of ruthenium trichloride. And from going from, and sorry that I didn't put that on the slide, this epsilon is basically a combination of the parameters between this H tilde and, this, uh, and the parameters of ruthenium trichloride. So what I'm, uh, in order to get these phases, um, I should manipulate a little bit ruthenium trichloride in order to bring in into this into this region. Is this okay. your question? Yeah, kind of. But but in terms of experiments, yes. so then, uh, like, is it possible that if you apply implement field, the system can transit from a zigzag phase to a U1 spring liquid? Without without um, manipulating ruthenium trichloride, let's say um, putting strain or some kind, um, I don't think so because um, these, let me just show you maybe in the next slide was better to see. Um, no, where is my here? Uh, when I was here, sorry. You see the steel, uh, even though we do have um, this, this these are the uh, parameters that where you do have this uh, S1 spin liquid corresponds to these parameters. And if you compare them with the parameters for the ruthenium drag right, still they are different. So that means you need to manipulate a little bit the system if you want to bring the, the ruthenium drag right really into this uh, U1 phase. But um, what I was trying to say is that it could well be that this is a competing phase in, in that, that it is there and um, whether uh, you could manipulate the system in order to approach uh, ruthenium drag right into these type of phases. And I do, the first thing you would see would be in terms of these shoulders until you really hit uh, maybe the phase transition. So this is the message of this type of phase diagram that um, in principle, you, can, you could manipulate your ruthenium trichloride a little bit more since this phase is somewhere there in the phase space, not that far away from uh, the parameters of ruthenium trichloride. Uh, do, do you mind ask another quick question? So, so do you think, so, so I, I think if there is a, so if, if there is a U1 spin liquid, somehow you can induce, so there has to be another second phase transition to a field polarized state, right? Yes, yes, here it is. Oh, I, I see, I see. So then, this, sorry, this is a blow up of this region here. This is the blow up, I'm sorry. So then yes. I'm curious, so, so like, uh, sorry, I, I'm not very familiar with U1 spring liquid with some, let's say neutral like Fermi surface. So like for, for U1 spring liquid with neutral Fermi surface, can, can it also host like a thermal hole? Uh, <laughs> In fact, this is a gapless. Um, it, it, yes, exactly. This is a gapless um, uh, spin liquid, and this is a, a well posed question. Uh, I don't know. I, I, so, in principle, uh, it would be interesting to uh, to look at that. Uh, what happens with the thermal hole in this type of um, phase uh, here? That uh, at least uh, is is there in these uh, phase diagrams when you. Um, when you put a magnetic field, and um, basically, when you uh, try to make the the model into a region where you could compare with the models for ruthenium trichloride, so it would be very interesting to see what happens with thermal hole uh, for this type of phase. Yes, uh, but wait a second. I mean, if, yeah, uh, the 
it, it would be very different from the Kitayev, um, uh, from the chiral Kitayev uh, spin liquid, right? Because in the chiral Kitayev, you, you need a gap in order to see these um, excitations. So it would be it would be interesting to see what happens with thermal hole. I don't know. Okay, thanks. Okay, the next person on the list, Yi Peng. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I have a question about uh, the B star, and uh, did I understand it correctly that nearby this uh, B star field, the interlayer coupling is kind of like you know. Um, uh, competing with each other in some sense. So my question is that maybe is it possible that you can apply some kind of pressure like uni axial such that you can see uh, whether this B star is related to the interlayer coupling, maybe enhance it or like a suppress it. Um, so so what you are asking is 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 the the um, what would be here the role of the three dimensional coupling? I mean. Yeah. This is an open question. And in fact, uh, it would be interesting to see that. Um, so, okay, so we, when we are here in this region, um, in fact, looking at the phase diagrams that I was showing, here in this region, we are indeed um, already in this uh, gapped polarized phase. So, in the where, where the magnon uh, appears. So, um, it would be very interesting to see indeed if you uh, change. The conditions of your system uh, that will also influence the uh, the state of your system, whether this shoulder is also um, is also uh, modified. I think I think it's 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 interesting to analyze that because um, of course you are going to change the excitations in your system, and therefore this should have some um, some appearance in this in this kind of quantity. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, anyone else? Well, I can see Sam Carr uh, on. Okay, Sam, Sam, do you want to um, ask your question? Sam Carr? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, if there's nobody else. Yeah, I not just, um, Yes, I was just quite curious um, about the phase transition between the two different spin liquids, um, the U1 and the Z2, because presumably yes. that's some form of quantum critical point, but. Do you have any idea how that would be classified? Okay, so this, uh, this um, let me tell you a little bit the story of this intermediate phase. So this was uh, in, uh, I think the first work where they talk about this phase uh, and this, um, this work and this work and, and this work, it was done for, so let's take the anti-ferromagnetic KITAF model. And um, um, these are mostly exact diagonalization uh, calculations uh, here in, in, in these are um, in, from Golk, Matthias Golk and collaborators. These are DMRG calculations. So it's a numerical way of looking at this phase. So this I have to tell because this is the numerics that show you that um, once you enter this phase, there is uh, in fact uh, um, uh, uh, your gap. You basically go into a gapless phase. Uh, and right now, as far as I know, uh, there are only we also did exact diagonalization, and this is the only thing you can analyze. Basically, what happened to your excitations? So I don't think that there is a deep um, analysis in, in, let's say, in which is not numerical numerics related. So um, this is what we know right now about these phases. And uh, here, uh, Kiaran and, and Simon, they also did exact diagonalization. So again analyzing what happens with your excitation spectrum as soon as you put a, a, a finite magnetic field. And you, you see a change of excitation spectrum between these two states. You also analyze, for instance, the omega order parameter that I didn't uh, show here. So this um, product of S uh, operators, and you also see a change in the om uh, omega parameter. So you are, you are rather sure that you go into a new phase. Okay, but you don't know for sure it would be a second order phase transition or anything. No, I don't think that. I, at least I can tell from our numerics this this is difficult to um, to uh, analyze. I mean, it's we are limited by the um, basically by the size uh, size effects, so finite size effects. Okay, thank you. 
Well, I, I see that Piers has uh, Maybe raised I the question. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll ask. First of all, thank you for a, a beautiful, a beautiful talk. Um, I wanted to ask a, a, a question, really for pedagogical reasons, at the very connected with the very beginning of the talk. Could you give us a simple physical reason why the super exchange J is suppressed for edge sharing octahedra in your spinner half uh, multiplet? Uh, yes, let me go to it the... It went past very quickly. And I, and I, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yes. I, it's so, a very important issue. Yes, okay. it is, yeah. it is. So let me, uh, let me here for the moment assume that I don't allow a direct interaction between these two, okay? So the only interaction that is happening be between these two um, uh, transition metal ions is through the ligand, so chlorine or oxygen, depending on the system you have, okay? So then I have, in principle, two possible interaction paths, so through this chlorine and through this chlorine. And these two paths, they basically uh, build a destructive, um, uh, a dest so, so they uh -huh. basically compensate each other. If, and, and this, uh, thanks okay. for asking, if, of course, I'm not allowing the direct uh, in exchange between both. So here I'm assuming yeah. that the distance between these two is far enough that only this is the important interaction through the, through the, okay. through the P orbitals, which... So, so, so is that because the effective hopping between the two sites has been destructively interfered to be zero. Yes. Is that yes. the right way of thinking about it? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Not a destructive interference, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we've got some time. We've there's got still, ten minutes. Yeah, there's still one more question from good, Liang, good. Liang Wu again. Yeah, so since uh, there is uh, still, I think there's still seven minutes left, I hope it's fine to ask another question. So, sorry, sorry. I still have a question about the UN Spring Liquid. So, I mean, uh, Sentio gave, gave two talks like in the past, maybe last week. Yeah. Um, so, like in his picture, in order to kind of host UN Spring Liquid phase, the system needs to be kind of uh, close to. Uh, in other words, the mod gap needs to be small so that you can tune, like a, through a mod insulate transition. That in his uh, uh, picture. But the Rosina Cora, I think the gap, the mock gap is like uh, 200 milli EV, right? Uh, well, I mean, there's this, yeah, okay. The charge gap is about 1.5 uh, electron volts. Um, and but, uh, yeah, there is there is a discussion about the gap, but yes. So, 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 so the, the, the gap I'm talking about is between the, the J uh, equal to J effective to one half and uh, uh, to the three half. I think that gap is 200 yes. milli uh, yes. according to optical measurement. Yes, that's correct. So, and uh, so, 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 so then, then, then when, 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 like when you talk, talk about like gapless, like you want spin liquid. So, do you mean the kind of spin, spin, spin part? Spin part, yes, yes, the spin, the spin part. Yes. So, so the so the charge part can still be a mod insulator, but the spin 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 part can be gapless. Yes. Yes. I see it. Yes. Yes. So so exactly um, because we always have to distinguish. Thanks for the question. We always have have to distinguish between the charge gap and the spin gap, and this would correspond to a phase where the spin gap is zero. This intermediate phase. Okay, thanks. Well, I don't see any questions here. Okay, so I stop sharing. Sharing. Oops. Um, yeah. Although I, I, I just wonder whether um, you have anything to say about Hide's uh, new new system. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's <clears throat> yeah, that's. And I think this is a very interesting system. I mean, Hide already um, said a little bit about that. Um, the fact that um, there are these, uh, so the system, basically you have this hydrogen 
in uh, so they they basically substitute lithium by hydrogen and um, these hydrogens are extremely important in order to determine uh, the interactions in the layer um, and moreover what uh, we analyze a little bit uh, these effects because hydrogen in fact is doing some type of quantum tunneling there between um, between the oxygens and what we found is that uh, probably the system uh, would be described by um, a very disordered bonds. So it, disorder is important in this system. And um, so we did some modeling on, on that. Uh, for instance, Nat Natalia Perkins and Johannes Knolla and Roderick Mosna has, have been also looking at that. So this system is not the typical KITAF type of system, but it has, uh, it has this part of disorder that I think it's interesting to, to look into that. So, um, which disorder in these other materials um, has a different type of, um, basically, uh, it, it's, it's different there, uh, what disorder is doing. Okay. Uh, uh, Liang, do you still have another question or, or have you not lowered oh, your hand? No, I don't, I don't have further questions. Okay. Thank you. Uh, in that case, anyone else? Okay, so maybe we can slightly early, but uh, nevertheless, we let's uh, thank uh, Rosa again. Unmute and thank uh, collect for Rosa. Thank you. Talk. And uh, Piers, are you going to um, break us up into uh, breakout rooms? Yes, I'm going to break uh, break everyone up into breakout rooms. Thank you, Rosa, for such a wonderful talk. It was very, very clear, very pedagogical. Um, and uh, uh, we are now about 90 people, so I'm going to break us up into about 10 breakout rooms. Thanks very much, everyone. Are we going to see you in half an hour? Johannes, Johannes Noller's uh, talk will be in, uh, not, sorry, Johannes Lichner's talk will be in, 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 what, in half an hour's half time. Hour. Yeah. Are we going to take another photo or? Uh, we uh, could do that. Would everyone like to have got time? Well, everyone, please put on your uh, videos just to capture the moment. <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable when you see that. Actually, people have, are leaving. It's now down to 60 something. Yeah, so, well, I'll catch a quick one. It still looks pretty impressive, I would. Yeah. Coffee break photo. A coffee, coffee photo, break. yeah. Okay. Good afternoon. Okay, there we go. Smile. People are still coming in. Okay, great. Okay, we're going to do breakout rooms. Well, we're now down to 33 people, so I think we'll just do three breakout rooms. <laughs> See you okay. in See you in half an hour, everyone. Okay, excellent.
uh, Johannes. Hello. Hello. Hi, Andrew. How are you? I'm fine. And you? Yeah. Uh, let me turn on my video. I'm I'm, I'm pretty good too. <laughs> it's, okay. Uh, it's, are you actually in the UK or? Yeah, yeah. I'm in London. Right, right. I, I some of my colleagues, uh, Italians, Germans, they they are actually back in Italy or Germany or something. Yeah. Well. Um, yeah, I mean, Germany is, like, I guess, a little bit better uh, ahead of the... A lot better. <laughs> yeah, but uh, no, I've been here all the time. Um, uh. Okay, so do you want to try uh, your share screen now? Yeah, let's see. Uh, there we go. Okay. When are you guys... Uh, uh, do, have they given you any timing yet when, when you might be going back to... Um, to work? Lab, lab, yeah, your office and everything. Um, I think, um, I, I think since I'm having a, a, you know, a single occupancy office, I might be able to use it pretty soon. Oh, okay. um, but I think lectures in the fall term will probably be remotely delivered. Right. So we, we, we are, we are having a weird situation where they tell us uh, there will be 50% uh, okay. face to face teaching. I don't know how, but uh, <laughs> so most of the um, lectures are going to be um, online, but somehow uh, they, they want to attract the students to come back. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, that, I mean, students will want to be there physically. I mean, that, that makes sense to me. Yeah, but on the other hand, when they come back, uh, they will have to still social distance and there may even, I, I don't know if uh, we are going to do it, but there are talks that they might form bubbles. So a group of them can be uh, together for, 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 for um, more than just uh, a few minutes, but you, you're not supposed to mix between different small bubbles of, I don't know, I see. Okay, I see. or something like that. I, I, I've read about it in, 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 the, in the news. Okay, um, that, anyway. that I haven't heard yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but for sure, if we are going to have even one meter social distancing means uh, a quarter of the capacity of, of any rooms, basically, lecture right. rooms. So uh, I don't know how we are going to manage if we have any face-to-face. I mean, -face. Yeah, I mean, if you open the pubs, you might as well open the university. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Uh, All right, let me let me see if I can share my screen. Um, does that work? Yeah. All right, and you see my 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 mouse too. Yeah. Okay. Good. Then. All well, right. I, I, not I noticed that some people have a more fancy uh, uh, pointer on on. Um, uh, yeah, I guess you can do a laser pointer or something, but I think yeah, I'll just have a red, red dot, yeah, which is right, perhaps right. more more visible. I don't know. Visible. Let, let me see. How how would I do that? Uh, is there? Yeah, in PowerPoint, is there a um, tool somewhere or, or drawing thing? Tips. Tips. Uh, help. I don't know. I don't actually use PowerPoint myself, so. Mm. Well, I mean, I think I can probably live with the mouse. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's pretty uh, obvious. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. All right. I guess for the next time, I'll try to find it out. <laughs> right. As long as, uh, yeah, for, for some of us, uh, if the mouse moves too quickly, it's kind of hard to see. I see. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll try to, to be slow in my motion. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, are you yeah. also in London or? Hmm? Yeah, I'm in, in London. Actually, I'm 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 anti-commuting. <laughs> anti-commuting. Anti yeah, because I, I live in central London, whereas uh, Egham, as you know, it takes half an hour to get there, 40 minutes. Okay. Yeah. So that's actually scary for me because uh, I didn't realize that 60% uh, of uh, workers in London actually commute. Yeah, almost everybody. Almost commutes. nobody lives in, in central London. <laughs> well, vast majority, well, ma majority, in it, yeah. Hi, Pierce. So, yeah. Where, do you live in central London? Hi, how are you? you? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks. Very hot. It's very hot. It's a very hot day here. Yes. <laughs> yeah, one of the, I, I, we're fortunate that, that we are able to co come into the lab. Um, I'm able to come into the lab and it's much cooler here. I see, I see, yeah. and One of the reasons I come in to get some work done because it's cooler than at home, yeah. Well, I have a little pool for my daughter in the garden, but I, 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 I'm hesitant to give the talk from the pool, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that... not quite time to break, out, break the breakout rooms, yeah, okay. To answer your question, Andrew, I, I live in uh, north of Finsbury Park, uh, Wood Green area. Okay. Right. I've vaguely been to um, Finsbury Park once or twice. It's it's quite quite, quite a diverse area in Finsbury, Finsbury Park. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Similar. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's in the process of gentrification, I guess. What what, what you would describe it. <laughs> right. Right. I mean. Yeah. It, a diverse area has a, a advantages because you've got tons of interesting restaurants that are not not just the boring chains. That's true. That's true. On the other hand, uh, Tottenham, which is right next to us, is basically the center of you know uh, uh, all the drug related crime that that London is suffering from. So <laughs> it, it is mixed. Uh, of course, prices house prices are a little lower, which sort of uh, you know clinched the, <laughs> uh, yes. the decision for us. Mind you, I read that uh, the um, house prices are, are going to bomb, more, more or less started bombing now in London, yeah. central London. Who knows? Yeah, well, that's, uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, so, so you, well, you've given one talk before, so you know how, how this goes. Hopefully, I'll be able to um, find a, a useful time to interrupt when, when there are questions. Oh yeah, feel free to interrupt any time. I think that was actually, I mean, I, I, I very much like that format if you just sort of interrupt uh, any time when there's a question. Okay. Okay. Gosh, someone has a six digit number as, as his login name, his or her login name. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you want to be incognito. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you have any enemies, Johannes? <laughs> well, I'll find out, I guess. <laughs> 642447. Okay, so the breakup. Maybe we should find out who they are, send them to chat. Hi, Gunnar. Hey, how are you, Jonas? Yeah, I'm good. I'm, I'm very warm, but uh, I guess you are probably too. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is. I mean, I don't complain, though. It's a quite a nice experience for a change. No? Yeah, I, I do complain, but it, but it is quite nice. <laughs> <laughs> but you guys have a garden, right? Do you have a garden, Johannes? Yeah, I have a small garden, yeah. Well, central London, like me, we, I, I don't have, I don't even have a garden that I can access to nearby, unless I go all the way to Green Park or something. Right. Yeah. Are you that's, that's central? Okay. Uh, you live close to Green Park. 
not 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 that close actually it's uh 15 20 minutes walk okay that's not close bad. enough you should go walking there andrew get out get some exercise yeah except that there are about ten thousand other londoners having the same <laughs> idea i think ten thousand is probably an understatement right? <laughs> <laughs> Probably there are 100,000 who have the same yeah. idea. <laughs> Put your mask on and get out there. <laughs> My, yeah. Uh. Well, I, I, I am looking forward to uh, having a bit more uh, freedom. <clears throat> next, uh, next week, is it that we, we start to be able to use uh, restaurants? Or? Yeah, fourth like of fourth. Up week. Week. Oh. Yeah. We have we, we our first outdoor restaurant this weekend for three or four months. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We have outdoor dining opening up in New Jersey. And they're, they're even talking about imposing quarantine for travel from, from the more infected states to New Jersey and New York now. Because we've, <laughs> we've, we've more or less passed the peak and are down back to more or less normal level. But... Uh, the other parts of the USA are, are climbing like crazy. Um, but you guys are still locked down, semi-lockdown, or are you more or less okay now? Um, first of all, I think our lockdown was much was fairly chilled out compared to other parts of the world. Um, but we're just opening up this this week. Um, we can get our hair cut. I'm going to get my hair cut tonight for the first time oh. in four months. Yeah, I, I've got so much stuff on my head at the moment it's just yeah <laughs> it so, looks uh, terrible so down, yeah. <laughs> well they claim that at the moment we are now back to pre-lockdown level of um, infection which actually isn't that great because we locked down very late <laughs> yeah right no but you but the infection levels in in britain seem to be on an average at least seem to be quite good now um uh yeah i mean i think what i heard was i mean there was still 900 or so new cases today right um i mean i think they tend to, they maybe are less severe than in the early phase because you know the medical teams know what they're dealing with but I mean, there's still a lot of people who get effect, infected right? Well, I think they also now test a lot more people. So 9,000 probably does mean more like 9,000, whereas in the early days, 9,000 meant 90,000. No, that's an underestimate. They, they, they say it's more than 10 times. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. OK, well, yeah. um, we can give it a few more minutes uh, as the numbers come back up. Uh, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on the recording. And everyone has left the breakout rooms, have they? Yeah, the breakout room rooms are now closed, yes. Okay. They're now closed. And now we, uh, right. Yes, unlike um, rooms in a regular conference, peers can actually just get rid of the room. <laughs> <laughs> I can. <laughs> I can. Which you're probably you not supposed to do in a regular <laughs> building. <laughs> Well, well, they they may be uh, in the middle of the um, solution of the high TC problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. Tough luck. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, um, I think what we're going to do is we're going to I'm going to hand it over to you, Andrew, and uh, you can take the uh, introduction away, and off we go. Okay. So uh, welcome back. Uh, Let's start. Um, today we have the second talk from Johannes Lischner. Uh, he did his PhD at Cornell uh, in the group of uh, Professor Thomas Arias, then a postdoc at uh, Berkeley, UC Berkeley with Stephen Louis and Martin Cohen. Uh, since 2014, he is in Imperial as a Royal Society University fellow, research fellow at um, Department of Materials and Physics and a senior lecturer in Department of Materials. So one of his uh, current line of research interests, and this is not the only one, he, he is, uh, has uh, many other ones, 
uh, is in the um, studies of electronic properties via the FT, uh, density functional theory and first principles perturbation theory and uh, classical force field methods in 2D materials like graphene and particularly today's topic, twisted by layer graphene, uh, which he's now going to tell us more about. Johannes. Okay, thank you very much, Andrew, for uh, the, the kind introduction. Um, and uh, of course, I, I wanna thank uh, all the organizers of, uh, of this wonderful uh, conference to, to invite me back. Um, as, as I alluded to uh, on Monday, uh, last year's talk was actually uh, extremely important because it led to a new uh, collaboration with uh, Dimitri Efetov that, that I will sort of talk about in the end of, of my talk that, that really sort of shed new light on, on, on the physics of this, of this new material. Um, as this is sort of the second part of, of, of a two-part uh, uh, seminar. I will be much briefer, of course, in the introduction since I, I, I gave a lot of uh, introduction into the into the topic on on Monday. Let me see. Okay, so uh, twisted bilayer graphene is is of course a, a more array material that you uh, get by sort of uh, putting two aligned graphene sheets on top of each other and then rotating uh, the one with respect to the other one. And what emerges is this. Uh, a lovely Moore array pattern where you have uh, AA regions where the graphene sheets are, are perfectly on top of each other, and then AB or BA region where sort of the carbon atom from one are in the middle of the hexagons of the other ones. And, and so these regions form uh, this uh, emergent Moore array pattern. Um, one of the things that I think uh, we as theorists should emphasize very heavily is that theory, it was actually theory that predicted that this is an interesting system to look at. So in particular, it was uh, a couple of groups, but uh, the most prominent one was uh, the group of uh, Al McDonald and uh, Bistritzer who predicted in 2011 um, that this material should exhibit flat bands when you uh, tune the twist angle to the so-called magic angle which is around 1.1 degrees. So here I'm showing you again the, uh, the evolution of the band structure. Um, so this is the non-interacting tight binding band structure as a function of twist angle. And what you see is that the width of these flat bands, uh, the width of these bands uh, near the Fermi level, they, it uh, shrinks and shrinks as you approach this magic angle. So here we're very close and you can see these bands only have a width of you know maybe 10 milli electron volts, but then if you go beyond to even smaller twist angles, it sort of opens up again. And uh, of course, flat bands means slow electrons, and that means sort of the electrons have very little kinetic energy, and that in turn means that it is likely that electron-electron interactions are going to play a, a prominent role in this material at, at in the vicinity of the magic angle. Uh, no, Johannes, just, yeah. a, a, a question from Ignat uh, Go ahead. Fiskowski. Um, Ignat, do you want to uh, unmute and ask your question? No, maybe it's just, just on the chat. So the question is, why is the magic angle uh, 1.05 and not 1.25 degrees? I, I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying it's 1.05, um, and I'm not saying it's 1.25. I mean, it, it's sort of. I mean, uh, so sort the of magic angle, the precise value depends on the parameters of your model, and uh, sort of depending on who does the calculation and what he fits his his models to, the the magic angle is somewhere between one and 1.2 degree. Uh, here I'm showing you just a bunch of band structures with from with the smallest bandwidth at 1.25, but the bandwidth will decrease as you go to a little smaller twist angle. That, that's all I'm saying here. Okay, thank you. Um, can I just right. also ask a, can I also ask a follow up question on this? Because if I understood from your previous talk, the size of the unit cell in each of these figures is different. So the scale of going from K to gamma is different. 
and so on. These are different wavelengths. So what exactly do you mean by comparing a flat band? Because the state, I mean, it's very difficult to tell because the scale on the x-axis is different in each case. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. But um, if you calculate the band velocity, it is still true that at the magic angle, the band velocity goes to zero, right? So if you if you turned off interlayer coupling and you calculated the band velocity uh, the band velocity as a function of twist angle, it would always be the same as that that of graphene. But if you actually turn on interlayer coupling, you can see that the band velocity actually goes to zero at the magic angle. So I'm, okay. I'm talking about the slope of the band. Okay, so really, do. so we can't necessarily see that from these figures, but you're telling us it does happen. Exactly, exactly. So I mean, I, I appreciate your point that the that the scale on the x axis is changing, and that makes it a little harder to compare. That's that's true. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, right. So 2011 theory, uh, a, a true theory prediction. Uh, and then it took uh, experiment quite a few years to catch up, but eventually 2018, the, the group at MIT uh, of uh, Pablo Yarillo Herrero uh, was able to, to fabricate these very precisely aligned uh, samples and uh, measure transport properties. And indeed there was interesting uh, physics that uh, they uh, hypothesized to be related to electron-electron interactions playing a dominant role and in particular at, uh, at high elevated temperature that manifests itself as additional insulating states, uh, which are these two here at minus and plus NS over two, which are not predicted by a band structure picture and therefore are sort of, uh, assigned as, as correlated insulator states as opposed to, to band insulator states. Uh, when you cool it down, uh, uh, it, what they also found was the emergence of, of superconducting domes on, on both sides of the MOT or correlated insulated states. And so you can, they were able to make a phase diagram of carrier density versus temperature, um, which if you compared it to the, the high temperature cuprates, which are shown on the right here, uh, they, this bears some remarkable uh, uh, similarities. And so, um, a lot of people were in, intrigued or are still intrigued by this possibility of maybe understanding uh, Cooper physics, well, through uh, a twisted bilayer graphene. But I guess one, one of the messages of my talk today is that you have to be careful. I mean, it might just be that, uh, you know, in, in, talking in biological terms that uh, twisted bilayer graphene and the Cooper uh, are, are similar uh, phenotype. So they, they look the same. But when you sort of look inside uh, at the genetic makeup or uh, the, the microscopic mechanisms that give rise to this phase diagram, it might be uh, that they're different, right? And, uh, and uh, so that will be one of the, the main lines that, that I'll, I'll, I'll talk about in, in, my, in, in my talk today. So from a theory point of view, you could basically say the simple question that we have to answer is, what is the role of electron-electron interactions in this material? We, we understand, without electron-electron interactions, we essentially understand this material. All the complicated physics is associated with electron-electron interactions and, and possibly also other type of interactions like, like electron phonon. Now, uh, it might be very tempting to sort of, you know, jump in, into the middle and, and try to understand broken symmetry phases of this material. And, and historically, I have to admit, that's what I did. Uh, but recently, I've started to trace my, my, uh, retrace my steps and, 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 and decided to uh, study electron-electron interactions in the normal state first. And I, I hope I can show you that there's a lot of interesting lessons to be learned in the normal state. So how do we study uh, the normal state of twisted bilayer graphene? So by normal state, I mean either sort of the semi-metallic state when it's undoped or, or the metallic state when, when it's doped. And the, the theory that we have been using uh, to describe electron-electron interactions is, uh, can be described as an atomistic tight binding based heart rate theory. So what we do is we add to the non-interacting tight binding Hamiltonian that I discussed uh, on, on Monday, we add a sort of interaction term, 
which is sort of uh, a local, which can also be interpreted as a local on-site energy that depends on position. And this is the Hartree uh, potential energy. When the Hartree potential energy is calculated from the density, um, so N of R is the electron density, N zero is a reference density, and uh, a W is uh, the fundamental interaction. And here I'm making the assumption that the fundamental interaction is just a one over R interaction that is screened by some background dielectric. So we were dealing with long ranged interaction here, which is sort of what we would expect of a two dimensional semi metal like, like graphene. Uh, let me also say that uh, we need this reference density uh, basically because we can only do periodic calculations on a neutral system. So somehow we have to compensate for these additional, if, if we want to study doped systems, we somehow have to put you know, uh, uh, some balancing charges. And in addition, we also want to, want to avoid a double counting of interaction uh, because the hopping parameters here are fitted to DFT and the DFT already contains some Hartree interactions within itself. So, so we don't want to double count and that we can achieve by subtracting an appropriate uh, reference density. Um, and so this uh, is, him. yeah, go ahead. Sorry, there, there is a um, question from the chat. Uh, from Yi Ping Huang. In this Hamiltonian, are you using fridge, what's fridge spinner type weight? Uh, can you, uh, Yi Ping, can you um, unmute yourself and ask the yes, question? Yes, yes. Uh, I have a question. So when you write down this effective Hamiltonian, in principle, you need to write down some localized uh, one-year orbitals, right? So at no, this no, no. level, I mean, you... No, no, no. This is an atomistic Hamiltonian. Uh, CI and CJ create PZ, uh, are, are, the, or, are the creation operators for PZ, atomistic PZ orbitals. Oh, I see, I see. Thank you, thank you. So what we're dealing here is we're dealing with a mean field, cal a self-consistent mean field calculation in a very large uh, Hilbert space. So we're dealing with 10,000 atoms unit cells. We're dealing with all the degrees of freedom, all the PZ orbitals and solving this problem self-consistently. So computationally, this is quite intensive. So much, much harder to do than a simple atomistic uh, tight binding calculation. Um, but then we get band structures out of this uh, mean field theory. And basically we get band structures as function of doping. So here we see, uh, I'm showing you four different band structures, nu, is the number of electrons that have been added uh, to each Moira unit cell. So uh, you, zero means neutral. Uh, and then one, two, three means one, two, three electrons have been added. Of course, the maximum you can add is four before you completely fill uh, the flat uh, conduction bands. And what you see here in the, in the corresponding colors are the band structures of these doped materials. And now there's a couple of interesting observations that you can make uh, from this band structure. In particular, what you see is that doping leads to a distortion of the band structure. The band structure becomes less electron hole symmetric than it is in the neutral system. In particular, what you see is the more electrons you add, the flatter the conduction band become, becomes. But on the other hand, the valence bands become more dispersive. So actually the overall bandwidth doesn't change by that much, but sort of the bandwidth of the conduction band becomes smaller and the, band, uh, and the bandwidth of the valence band becomes bigger as you dope electrons. Now we can also see what happens when we dope holes and the opposite happens. So what happens is that the valence band gets flatter and flatter as I add more and more holes while the conduction bands become more and more dispersive. So this is at a twist angle of 1.54 degrees. So it's a little ways off the, the magic angle. So why does this happen? Uh, why, why does, you know, I mean, if you just have tight binding, then of course you cannot capture the effect of, you know, uh, 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 of doping on the band structure. So, so Hartree theory gives you sort of this qualitatively new effect. And uh, basically the reason why Hartree theory gives you this effect is because microscopically we're dealing with an inhomogeneous material. Um, so here I'm showing you the charge density 
of uh, 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 doped twisted bilayer graphene. So here uh, I've added three electrons in the Moiré cell. And what we know is that these carriers localize in the AA regions. Uh, so there is an, a, a large charge density in the AA regions. And that, of course, this charge density creates a Hartree potential. Now, this Hartree potential uh, actually will push up any charge that is localized in the AA regions. And that's precisely what we see here. Um, so let me try to go back. So the states at K are states that are localized in the AA regions. And they are essentially pushed up relative to the states at gamma because the states at gamma are actually not localized in the AA regions. They have a ring-like shape. So by adding these extra electrons, we create this repulsive potential in the AA regions that pushes up states in the AA regions. And that sort of leads to this deformation of the band structure and the flattening of the conduction band. Right. Okay, and now, now that we have understood this effect, um, what's going on, we can study the band structure as a function of, of twist angle uh, in, in, in this material. So here I'm showing you again an the evolution of the electron dope band structure as a function of twist angle. 1.54 I've already shown you. Um, now let's go to maybe 1.2. You see something interesting is happening. The bands have gone very flat for uh, nu equals one, but then for nu equals two, the conduction band has actually completely inverted, All right? So you get qualitative changes, not only deformations and distortions, but actually qualitative changes to the band structure. And the interesting thing is you get these extremely flat regions in the bands near gamma, right? So basically completely flat bands. And then uh, if we look, uh, at 1.16, which is uh, very close to the magic angle in our, in our method. So you see the, the, the uh, neutral band structure is basically very flat. And if we include now electron-electron interactions, we see that these hard tree interactions lead to a significant widening of the bands, of the bands as a function of uh, doping. And uh, then as we go beyond uh, the, the magic angle, so let's say theta 1.05, it starts going back to sort of a qualitative, uh, uh, to, the, to, the, to the picture of, you know, 1.54 degree. Um, so so there, there are sort of very distinct new effects uh, that you get already from, from a self-consistent heart tree approach. Um, and these new effects, they raise some interesting questions. Um, in particular, you could ask, you know, what is really the magic angle now? What, what is really the magic angle if I take electron-electron interactions into account? You know, the, the flat band width that people often talk about, you know, that, that's just a proxy really. I mean, what matters if you think about weak coupling theory is basically this density of states at the Fermi level, right? Um, or you could say what is, what is more closely related to the density of states of the Fermi level is actually the width of let's say the dope band. So here I'm showing you now the width of the conduction bands of the electron dope system. And in contrast to the total bandwidth, which has the sort of very nice V shaped, you see that if I look at only the conduction bandwidth, I get a much more complicated picture, right? So, so sometimes these minima, so here the different colors again, uh, describe different doping levels. So if I look at nu equals three, you see my, my minimum, my smallest bandwidth is actually at an angle of 1.3 and then it increases again. Um, and uh, well, similar for uh, nu equals two, you see I'm getting sort of a couple of angles where I get very flat conduction bands. So, so this really asks the question, you know, is the magic angle as identified from band structure theory, is that really relevant to predict the twist angles where I should expect strong correlation phenomena? And I think you know, the answer is probably not really. So now let's also look at the evolution of the whole dope twisted bilayer uh, uh, as function of twist angle. And what we see is something similar. 
So now the valence bands flatten and at some twist angles. So here, for example, for nu equals minus three, I get extremely flat valence band in, in, this, in the gamma region. And then as I go closer to the magic angle, I get this inversion of the band structure, which again is not predicted by uh, non-interacting tight binding theory. So again, the, the key lesson is of course that you know, analyzing the effect of electron-electron interactions in the normal state is, is quite relevant and gives us sort of new insights. Uh, before you go on, uh, yeah. Sam has a question uh, on chat. If I recall correctly, relaxation of the lattice has to be taken into account when working out the band structure. Uh, does one have to consider further lattice movement when doping? <laughs> that is a very good question. And the answer is in principle, yes. Um, in practice, uh, nobody has done that yet. Um, so, yeah, because uh, basically what most people do is they use a classical force field uh, to, to do the relaxations. And classical means that this force field doesn't know about electrons. So this, you know, in, yeah. So in principle, yes, in practice, we don't know how to do that. But it, it is a very good question. <laughs> Um, so uh, on Monday, I was asked about uh, how one could sort of ascertain that these flat bands are real, which of course is a good question since we're basically obsessing about them. And of course, the most direct probe of the band structure is uh, RPES. And quite recently, uh, uh, there was a group that did a nano RPES experiment on twisted bilayer graphene at the magic angle. And uh, this is their result. Um, and what you see here is, of course, on the y-axis, you get to see a very big energy scale from, from zero to one. And well, this red arrow denotes the flat bands. And uh, well, I mean, the only thing you can really say is, yes, there are probably flat bands, but that's all you can really say from this picture, which is, you know, is, is, is of course, a comforting knowledge that, you know, they, they do exist. Um, but we, from, from ARPAS, we can't really learn much about uh, the, the flat band dispersion. A much more useful uh, technique is scanning tunneling microscopy or scanning tunneling spec spectroscopy, STM or STS. And, and that has been done by a couple of experimental groups. Um, so here I'm showing you uh, a, a spectrum from uh, Karelsky et al. So this is the Columbia group. Um, where on the x-axis is the energy in milli-electron volts. You can see you have very fine resolution. And then on the y-axis, well, is what they call the local density of states. A more accurate description is it's the tunneling spectrum. And what you see is that there are some very pronounced peaks in the AA regions. Um, and then, well, there are some relatively minor peaks in the, a, in the AB region. So most people sort of focus on, on the AA regions. So, so let's understand uh, this, this results uh, using our band structure. So, um, so here's again the band structure of twisted bilayer graphene. And from the band structure, we can of course calculate the local density of states. And this is done here. And so you see that the local density of states indeed has two peaks. And these peaks actually derive from states near the endpoint of uh, the unit cell. So uh, this is, of course, a point where you have a saddle point in the band structure. So what you see here is, is a well-known Van Hove singularity. And since the states at the endpoint are mostly localized in the AA regions, you get a big LDOS in the AA region and just a, a relatively minor one in the AB region. So, so this is basically consistent um, with uh, theory. And what it tells you is that the separation of the Van Hove singularities uh, of these peaks is basically a reflection of you know, the, the band structure. So that's something that, that is sort of very important to study. Now, what they also do is a very detailed study uh, as a function of doping, right? Because you can dope a twisted bilayer graphene very easily using the electric field effect in a, in a, in a, in a, in a transistor setup. And so here on the left-hand side, you see, as a, on the, you see as a function of doping level, so all of these are, are spectra, four different doping levels, right? And on the, on the, on the x-axis is uh, uh, the energy in milli-electron volts. 
Now, of course, you have to look at this for, for, for quite some time to digest uh, this wealth of information, but the main points are if we look at sort of the extrema, right? So let's look at the bottom here. And what we see is basically the Van Hoff singularity close to uh, zero, and zero is of course the Fermi level is, is quite sharp, while the Van Hoff singularity that's further uh, from the Fermi level is broader. And as we go to the very top, we see that it has switched, right? So he, now the left, firm, the left Van Hoff singularity is, 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 is uh, sharper and the one on the right is a little bit broader. If we look at the dispersion of these Fermi velocities, we can also see that there is a change in their distance as a function of doping level. Now on the right hand side is a zoom in uh, and what they sort of pointing out in this graph is that sometimes uh, you actually see sort of a breaking up of the Van Hoff singularity and you get a sort of double peak. And this double peak is actually interpreted as a signature of a broken symmetry state. So you could explain this double peak, for example, by the system becoming uh, magnetic. Uh, Johannes, uh, there's a question on chat. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, it's quite a long one. Um, if one thinks naively the Moiré unit cell size would increase as twist angle decreases and the bandwidth would be inverse proportional to the unit cell size. This naive picture seems to work for the angles larger than one degree, but not for small angles. Is there a simple answer for that? This is from Sun Sub Lee. Um, this Okay, so I, I think I might kind of defer this question to the end because it's not directly related to, to the discussion at hand. Is, is that okay? Because I, I mean, I think I, I have to think about it more than, than, than I can do right now. Uh, so, so apologies. I think I, I'll, I'll, let, let's, let's discuss this after the talk if that's okay. So, um, Okay, so let me let me just let me let me stick with the discussion of the STM spectra for now uh, for a fixed twist angle. Um, so here I'm showing you an STM result from a different group. So this is the group of Ali Yazdani in Princeton, and uh, so here they're showing you uh, basically the same thing, but in a, as a heat map. So they're showing you as a function of doping the evolution of the tunneling spectrum. And what you see here is basically uh, this first region where you see the sort of linear dispersion. That's when uh, the flat bands are sort of completely filled and you get sort of two peaks that just move uh, basically because the Fermi level is changing. Then, however, once you hit the, once the Fermi level hits uh, the high energy Van Hoff singularity, basically, the, the spectrum stops moving. And what this means is you get Fermi level pinning. What is very, what is very interesting though, is that when, the, when this Fermi level pinning happens, if you look at the place and in, in, in the, in the, if you look at the spectrum, the Van Hoff singularity seems to completely disappear in this measurement. So that's very strange. So, and then it's the Fermi level stays pinned for a while until you're sort of, you know, you move uh, into sort of close to the charge neutrality point, which is sort of this region here. And then the spectrum becomes very symmetric and is unpinned. Then again, there's a short region of pinning when the Fermi level hits the other Van Hoff singularity. And then again, you have completely emptied out uh, uh, the flat bands and you again get a dispersive, um, you get a dispersive uh, tunneling spectrum. And uh, finally, I want to show you um, um, a, um, a, a measurement from the group of Naj Perg at, at uh, Caltech, which uh, sees something quite similar. So again, a dispersive uh, tunneling spectrum when the flat bands are completely filled, then you get Fermi level pinning. Then again, a dispersion near the charge neutrality point, another region of pinning, and then again, uh, dispersion. So, um, so this is sort of the state of the experimental uh, uh, knowledge of the normal state. So let's now try to compare this uh, um, to our uh, calculations. 
But before we do that, we can also look at the twist angle dependence of the tunneling spectrum. So, um, so here you see basically the result from the Columbia group for uh, 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 five different twist angles. And as you would expect, these Fermi, um, these Van Hoff singularities keep sort of approaching, uh, but weirdly, they keep doing that. So based on, on the band structure picture, at some point beyond the magic angle, you would expect uh, that they sort of uh, uh, separate again, but uh, this doesn't seem to happen in this experiment. So, so this is, I, I think, uh, a mystery. Anyway, so, so now I wanna compare these measurements to our atomistic heart rate theory calculation. And so I'm showing you now the local densities of states uh, for three different twist angles, 1.5, 1.4, 1.2. So 1.2 is of course the one quite close to the magic angle. And uh, as a function of energy with respect to the Fermi level, so zero is the Fermi level. And uh, basically um, I'm showing you sort of uh, again for um, uh, seven different doping levels. So nu is again, the number of electrons that you have added or removed from the material. Now let's start with uh, 1.5, which is quite far from the magic angle. And what we see is, well, we do get these Van Hoff singularities, um, and, uh, but they're sort of quite similar. So there's not, not a lot of asymmetry in these Van Hoff singularities. And you see that they sort of more or less readily move uh, past uh, the Fermi level. So, so here we don't see any Fermi level pinning. Now, if we look at 1.4, you see already uh, this is starting to change. So if I look at the red curve, nu equals minus three, you see that the Van Hoff singularities are very asymmetric. And this eight electron hole asymmetry is of course caused uh, by, by heart rate interactions and, and, and is in agreement with, with experiment. And what you also see is now the, the Van Hoff singularities don't move very readily past the Fermi level. So you start to see Fermi level pinning in, in, in the calculation as well. And it get, that gets even more pronounced when you go very close to the magic angle, you see strong asymmetries, strong Fermi level pinnings, and you start to see some very strange shapes in, uh, in, in the local density of states. So the Van Hoff singularities acquire some, some, some definite structure and uh, sometimes the structure looks a lot like a double peak. So um, this sort of raises then some questions about the interpretation of the uh, experiment, basically where this double peak was interpreted as a broken symmetry, as a signature of a broken symmetry. But here I'm showing you that even in the normal state, the Van Hoff singularity can acquire sort of non-trivial structure uh, in the vicinity of, of the magic angle. Okay, um, so this was all I wanted to say about the normal state. And you know, I, I hope I've shown you that there's already a lot of interesting stuff going on in the normal state before we start thinking about breaking any, any symmetries, thinking about sort of magnetism or superconductivity or, or any of that. But uh, so, so, so now in, in the second part of, of my talk though, I wanna, I wanna do just that and, and, and uh, see if we can sort of what we can learn about uh, broken symmetry states. Now, sort of the standard way people study broken symmetry states is using a model Pierce, Hamiltonian. Yeah. Pierce just had a question in the chat, so maybe it'd be good to take that before you yeah, move on to the next. So Pierce, do you want to state your question? Or? Unmute. Yeah, fascinating talk. Um, uh, I like the way you can get the Fermi, the, the, the pinning of the uh, the levels to the Fermi surface, Fermi energy. Can you uh, can you tell us a little bit more? Um, it can you, you is there a simple criteria for when the Coulomb interaction compared with the um, bandwidth uh, uh, is, is that is, is that the criteria for when you get pinning when when the Coulomb interaction exceeds the band the the Moiré bandwidth by a certain amount? Could, can you yes. give some yes, understanding? Yes, yes. So, I mean, what, what's what's happening is. Uh, so, so, so what you get is essentially this heart rate potential, right? And that heart rate potential has a certain variation throughout the unit cell, right? And so you can ask, uh, what, what is sort of the difference of the heart rate potential in the center of the AA region and versus the, uh, in the AB region, right? So this is the relevant scale. 
uh, that, that the interaction gives you, the variation of the heart rate potential throughout the unit cell. And, uh, and that you have to compare with, with the bandwidth, essentially. And okay. for 1.5, this is a, a small effect. But for 1.2, this is a big effect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Johannes. There's also a question from Jashar. Uh, sorry, I, I'm also very fascinated by this data. Uh, a question. So can you attribute this double uh, splitting of your, your one-hop similarity to, any, to anything? I mean, in principle, if you allow it, uh, the half tree theory can also capture some sort of a, a symmetry breaking. Uh, can it not? Well, I mean, yes, I mean, uh, symmetry breaking is one explanation, yes, but I'm, what I'm telling you is you don't have to go, you don't have to invoke it if you don't want to. Uh, basically, and let me scroll to the band structure. Basically, what, what, what we find is, um, well, I mean, I, I told you that the Van Hoff singularity is caused by states, by the stationary point, uh, by the stationary uh, uh, band near, near the endpoint. But yes. now, what you can get is sort of a flat, is this flat region near gamma. So this is a, a heart rate effect that you don't get in tight binding. And this flat region you see is, is, almost, is very close to, to, to where the band is at M, but it doesn't have to be exactly the same. So if this flat region near gamma is slightly offset from the band, uh, from the value of the band at M, then you can get two peaks, which are not precisely at the same energy. I see, I see. So it's some sort of a momentum dependent uh, heart rate. So again, it's a? Um, like a momentum dependent uh, shift of the potential, like a momentum dependent potential. A momentum dependent potential. Yeah, so exactly. So, so, so the heart rate potential leads to this complicated deformation of the band structure. Uh, there's it's not a simple shift. Yeah. And, and of course, fundamentally, all, all I'm saying is, you know, the charge density is inhomogeneous and that, 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 that <laughs> makes, it makes it complicated. Thank you. Um, I also have one quick question before you move on, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, about the normal state that when graphene and bilayer graphene were first made, there was a lot of excitement about the Dirac cones and berry phase and which gave rise to anomalous transport and everything. And I think you told us that these are still hexagonal moiré cells, just a lot bigger. So do you still expect them to have Dirac cone-like physics and all this anomalous behavior? And has anybody tried measuring this in the normal state? Uh, yes, so you would say there's still, uh, there's still an anomalous behavior going on. And, and there is sort of a lot of people thinking about the topological properties of this material and sort of things like uh, orbital magnetization have been uh, predicted, and there's uh, experimental work also by uh, Dmitry Efetov. So, 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 so all of these things, uh, it, it is, it, it, there, there are, yeah, there are similar questions being asked. Um, the topological properties are a little different because, um, you know, I mean, the the, point, the, the the key point is that the two K and K prime points of the uh, mini Brion zone, of the Moiré Brion zone, actually derive from the same K point of the graphene sheet. So, so that, that, that sort of gives rise to a, 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 a difference in, in the topological properties, but, but there are definitely uh, some, some aspects in, in that direction. It, it's just, I, I can't very uh, competently comment on, on these things. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, so um, let's see. So we wanted to uh, talk about electron-electron interactions and broken symmetry phases and the framework that uh, many people, sort of the, the traditional framework, let's say for this is studying uh, some sort of Hubbard Hamiltonian, which of course uh, might be suggestive because of the you know, apparent similarity uh, to the Cooper's. So if, if, you, if you're sort of saying, okay, let, let me try to describe twisted bilayer graphene by a Hubbard model, um, you still have sort of the question, okay, but, but what are the parameters? What is, what is T, what is U? And in particular, um, what we know about the Hubbard model is it's the ratio of U over T that determines where sort of broken symmetry phases are expected. 
Um, so as I described on Monday, um, you can calculate T and U from basically uh, by generating Wannier functions and then evaluating sort of the, the matrix element of the Hamiltonian, of the non-interacting Hamiltonian end of your interaction. So I, I won't go into, into detail. I'll just show you the results. So here on the left-hand side, I'm showing you the value of the uh, Hubbard uh, interaction, the on-site U, uh, as a function of twist angle. Uh, and I think we have assumed the sort of background dielectric of um, four or five here to, to basically uh, um, say that uh, the twisted bilayer graphene is sandwiched by hexagonal boron nitride slabs. And what you see is that uh, the Hubbard parameter uh, is sort of on the order of, uh, let's say 60 to 100 uh, MeV. And it sort of becomes smaller as the twist angle uh, decreases, and that's just a reflection of the fact that uh, the Wannier functions also scale with the size of the Moiré unit cell, so they become more and more delocalized as the unit cell grows, and that means sort of uh, that leads to a reduction of U. But then on the other hand, we know that the hopping is sort of proportional to the bandwidth, and so here I'm showing you the bandwidth as a function of twist angle, and of course that goes to zero at the magic angle. And so then we would expect, of course, if we calculate u over t, that at the magic angle, basically the thing blows up and, and it does. Um, but sort of the, the, the question is, what, what does it mean? So obviously, you know, it's, it's an interesting question because very close to the magic angle, we were very much in the strong coupling regime. Um, if we go further, maybe, maybe weak coupling approaches can be used. But in terms of the phase diagram, we have to compare sort of the value of u over t to the critical u over t where a phase transition happens. Now, of course, to, to say what the critical u over t is, you have to have you know, a theory of what the broken symmetry phase actually is. And, and then you have to calculate the critical u over t. Uh, we haven't done that, but what we've sort of said is, you know, what you would expect is that there is a phase transition when u over t is of the order of one. And basically, you know, we know from quantum Monte Carlo calculations of the untwisted bilayer and from some, you know, uh, RPA calculations of the spin susceptibility that you would expect phase transitions, at least to magnetic phases, to appear roughly at u over t of about two. So here, this, this horizontal line is u over t equals two. And why, you know, you have to take that with, with sort of a grain of salt. What you see here is that the actual u over t is always above this critical line. And what this means is you would expect basically broken symmetry phases over a very large uh, twist angle, um, or a very large twist angle window, which is, is act which, which is not what they see in experiments. So, so there must be a problem here. Can I, can I ask a quick clever clarification question uh these u yeah. and t parameters you're talking about is is that with or without a hard tree uh potential um so this is so we start with a tight binding band structure so without hard tree and then oh, okay. basically coulomb interactions are included through the calculation of u right, right. so so you you back to the um, bare band structure right. to get the so, u okay so there's no exactly. issue so, so T doesn't know about interactions at this right. point. Yes. Um, yeah. So I mean, chronologically, that that work actually came first, as I as I as I <laughs> into that. Um, okay. So there must be something wrong because this this prediction is in disagreement with with experiment. Um, and of course, obviously, what, what's wrong is that we were dealing here with with a two dimensional semi metal, and we know that that these materials have long ranged interactions. So what we can then look at are sort of extended Hubbard uh, parameters. So here we're calculating the matrix element of the interaction between Wannier functions in different Moiré unit cells. And here I'm showing you basically how these Hubbard parameters decay as a function of distance. And the black line is just the bare Coulomb interaction, right? So here I'm showing you results for three different twist angles. And you see uh, after a certain, after 100 angstrom, or 10 nanometer, they all fall on this, just the one over R line. So basically what this tells you is, you know, 
you should really look at the long range interactions just on site Hubbard is, is not going to be good enough. So then, of course, how do you deal with a long range uh, interact Hubbard model with long range interactions well I mean the elegant answer is you map it onto a short range Hubbard model. And, uh, and uh, that has been done, uh, for example, uh, by uh, uh, Schuler and, and, and co-workers in, in, in this paper. And basically what they're saying is you can map a long range uh, interaction, uh, a Hamiltonian with a long range interaction onto a short range Hubbard model by defining an effective view, which is basically the difference of the on-site Hubbard and the nearest neighbor Hubbard parameter. And basically what this says is that uh, if you look at these graphs down here, is the energy cost of going from a doubly occupied to uh, from to one uh, to two singly occupied uh, orbitals is not U because when the atoms are sort of on, on neighboring sites, you still have an energy cost of of V, then the nearest neighbor interaction. So the relevant energy scale is the difference between the on-site and the nearest neighbor Hubbard parameter, and this is precisely the definition of U star. So, um, so now, of course, we can easily calculate U star from our, um, from our uh, hub extended Hubbard parameters. And when we plot U star over T, we get this red line. And you see now this red line uh, is only in a short, in a small twist angle window above the critical U over T. Uh, which is a much better agreement with experiment, which only see strong correlation phenomena, you know, in a small twist angle window close to the magic angle. Okay, um, so next, of course, um, I want to talk about um, another effect of long ranged interaction, and that is screening. And, and this is particularly interesting because Screening is, is fundamentally different in a two-dimensional material than in a three-dimensional material. And actually, there are new sort of control knobs in a two-dimensional material that we simply don't have in three dimensions. So there are things that you can do to a twisted bilayer graphene that you couldn't do to the cuprates. And one thing uh, that you can very easily do is what, what we call device engineering. So this means you can change the interactions between electrons in the twisted bilayer graphene by sort of changing the environment in which the twisted bilayer sits. So here you see a, a typical device setup. And uh, well, the electrons, of course, feel the presence of the boron nitride substrate, which is a, a, which is a dielectric. But then they can also feel the presence of the metallic gates. And so. Um, Basically, the, the presence of these metallic gates through the well-known image charge interaction can sort of drastically modify uh, the interaction between electrons and the graphene. And this is, of course, something that can be tested experimentally, uh, but something you couldn't do, for example. So you can't play with the electron-electron interaction in the cuprates in, in that way. So here I'm showing you then um, the extended Hubbard parameters as a function of distance for sort of the situation where you have metallic screening. And you see it looks very much uh, different from a one over R. So uh, they, they decay much more quickly. So this is for a, a, a separation uh, of a 10 nanometers. So we assume that the boron nitride is, is 10 nanometers thick, which is of course quite thin. Um, so now we can also study, uh, so we can play this game uh, uh, even more, we can study uh, how things depend on the thickness of the boron nitride layer. So here I'm showing you the on-site Hubbard parameter as a function of uh, uh, zeta, which is the thickness of the boron, uh, of the boron nitride. And you see, uh, well, maybe not surprisingly, as the metallic gate gets closer and closer to uh, the bilayer, um, there's more and more screening. And as a consequence, the Hubbard parameter gets smaller and smaller. So um, then you could say, okay, so this means the material gets um, is less strongly correlated if you bring if you sort of make uh, a zeta small. But, but but we have to be careful, right? We, we just said the on-site Hubbard is not enough. We need to look at U star because interactions are long-ranged. Now. 
U star is, uh, is more complicated because it also involves uh, the nearest neighbor Hubbard uh, term. And sort of the, there's a question basically if the nearest neighbor uh, Hubbard interaction decreases much more quickly than the onsite, then it's possible in, in principle that the effective U increases as you decrease uh, zeta. Now, now this doesn't seem to happen. And, uh, and this is sort of something that's very special to, to twisted bilayer graphene that in fact, the effective U star also decreases. So I'm, I'm, I'm always somehow surprised that people do not find this finding surprising, but, but it, it actually is surprising that U star has the same behavior as U. Now, now we can now try to map out the phase diagram of twisted bilayer graphene as a function of the thickness of the boron nitride spacer layer. So to do that, uh, basically what we need is we need some information about you know, uh, what, what the relevant phases are and what the corresponding critical values of U star over T are. And we take that information from the study uh, here, Klebel and Honakamp, who have analyzed basically the spin susceptibility of twisted bilayer graphene um, as a function of, of U. And so they get a phase diagram, which is shown on the left here, where they see uh, where, the, where the squares denote um, uh, uh, anti-ferromagnetic insulators and the circles denote ferromagnetic insulators. So, and, and on the right-hand side, you see the corresponding critical values as a function of, of temperature. So, so this is not, not very important. And uh, basically we use this information then to construct these phase diagrams. So these are phase diagrams where on the x-axis you have uh, the value of um, the twist angle uh, relative to the magic angle. And on the y-axis you have basically the thickness of uh, the boron nitride layer. And so these three graphs correspond to three different doping levels. Now, how, how do you, how should you interpret these graphs? So, okay, so let's, let's say we're at uh, 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 minus two electron doping and we have a sample that is sort of minus 0.05 away from the magic angle. So we're sort of going up and down here. And what this tells you is basically, as you start from a very thick boron nitride layer, you have a broken symmetry phase. And as you sort of go down, as you go to a very thin boron nitride layer, something like two and a half nanometers, your system goes from the broken symmetry state back to the metallic normal state. Now, this is of course something that can be tested experimentally. And, and this is now where I'm going back to last year, where I basically showed in my talk that, you know, by sort of the, uh, the, uh, the by controlling the thickness of the boron nitride, you could potentially change uh, the phase diagram. And uh, there was an experimentalist in, in the audience, Dmitry Efetov, who basically said that, well, this is something, this is something we can test. So, and uh, here is his measurement. So he actually made three different samples um, with three different boron nitride thicknesses. So D3 has a boron nitride thickness of 12.5 nanometers, D2 has a boron nitride thickness of 10 nanometers, and then D1 has a boron thickness of seven nanometers. And for each of these, he did a transport measurement and sort of figured out the phase diagram as a function of doping on the X axis and temperature on the Y axis. Now for the, for the thick, for the thick uh, boron nitride layer, which is device D3, you get a phase diagram that looks very much like the one uh, we've seen before where you get sort of multiple correlated insulator states at integer fillings. And then between these correlated insulator states, there are a bunch of superconducting domes. But you see that the phase diagram changes quite dramatically as you go to a spacer layer of only 10 nanometer thickness. You see some of these correlated insulator states uh, start to disappear. And finally, as you, as you go to seven nanometers, almost all of them have disappeared. So there's a bit of a, of, a, of a signature here. And you see that the phase space of the correlated insulator states uh, seems to be taken up by the superconducting domes. 
Now, this is of course very interesting because what it, what it tells us that you know, uh, that, that, that this material might after all be, be very different from the cuprates. So in the cuprates, of course, uh, the, the, the dominant view is that the superconducting state is very closely related to the correlated insulator state. In particular, what, what many people think is that spin fluctuations uh, that are inherited from the antiferromagnetic parent state give rise to the Cooper pairing. So correlated insulator states and superconducting states are strongly linked. But here you see this, this doesn't seem to be the case. Here you can, so the, the correlated insulator state can completely disappear and the superconducting states can become stronger. So it seems like, you know, there, there's, you have to, you know, open our minds to the possibility that after all, um, these might be very, very, very different mechanisms that are at, at play in these, in these, in these, well, uh, clearly very different types of materials. Now, I haven't said much about uh, superconductivity, but uh, well, um, so now of course there's a big debate about you know what what now is the the, the mechanism of superconductivity. Um, so sort of uh, if you if you sort of uh, used to the cuprates, then you think that there is a magnetic sort of a spin fluctuation glue uh, that gives rise to Cooper pairing. Uh, but of course, there's also a big community who believes that uh, it might actually be just a traditional picture. It might just be phonons, because we know that in some materials like the buckyballs, uh, phonons can give rise to relatively high temperature superconductivity. And after all, we're only talking about transition temperatures uh, of about one Kelvin. So now I guess the situation is currently, you know, there are these two camps and uh, well, Every camp predicts, uh, each camp predicts a transition temperature of one Kelvin. So it's very hard to sort of say who's right. Uh, a brief interruption, sorry. Uh, yep. There is a, a chat question from Ignat Fyakovsky. Uh, sorry for a naive question, but integer filling is actually fractional if counted in terms of a completely full band. Yes, so I mean, by integer filling, I mean, if you count the number of electrons per Moiré cell. So each, you can fill up to, you can put up to four electrons into the bands or remove four electrons. So by integer, I mean one, two, three, four. Okay. So it's just, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it can be confusing. I agree. There's also a question from Sentil. Yeah, so uh, I actually have two questions. Uh, so the first, uh, is about the role of inhomogeneity. Uh, you know, it's easy to get an insulator if uh, it's easy to miss the insulator. You just need some percolating metallic part, right? Uh, sure. So, for example, you know, all these devices have twist angle disorder and other kinds of things. So, is that uh, uh, something you should worry about? Um, certainly, I mean, you certainly have to worry about these things. I mean, uh, uh, what I would, I, I mean, yes, you, you certainly room for missing these. I mean, these are I, what, what I would argue are the best, the, the most, uh, uh, the, the most homogeneous samples that have ever been made, uh, because uh, you know, uh, Efetov has these recipes for sort of creating very highly twist angle homogeneous materials. Uh, but of course, we have to keep our minds open to this possibility. Yeah, so, so, so the related question is that, uh, you know, as I assume, you know, there is this uh, paper from Brown University where they were able to do the same screening using, uh, you know, ordinary bilayer graphene located just three nanometers away. And because the density of states that, uh, in bilayer graphene can be controlled electrically, they're able to, in the same device, turn on or turn off the screening. Okay, and, and then they don't see that the correlated ins insulator disappears at all when they turn on the screen, even though it's only three nanometers away. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. So I mean, you know, inhomogeneity among different samples is is, is a problem, right? And uh, I mean, another thing what you could argue is there are small differences in in the twist angle. And uh, what what sort of we had long discussions is 
is the different, the small differences in the twist angle, are they more important than the small differences in the spacer layer? So uh, it, it, is, it is a good comment. Yes, I mean, uh, it's, uh, yeah, I, 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 don't, I, I don't know a good answer to this, uh, but. Uh, it, it seems as though, you know, different experiments uh, give different answers on this issue of screening. So, uh, so what's actually going on? What, what's the robust conclusion, according to you, that we should go? Well, I mean, I think that the key, the key thing. That, I mean, I, I, I don't think I don't want to conclude anything at this point. I think it's too early to conclude. I think we need uh, more samples and better controlled samples and see what uh, what measurements are. I think concluding anything too firmly at this point is is too early. I mean, I think. Uh, 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 but but what I can tell you is, you know, I mean, the, I mean, these things are uh, in, in agreement with what we expect based on these sort of detailed microscopic calculations that we can do. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, that that's, of course, something that might give some some confidence that, you know, if you do the calculation, you would expect you, 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 you predict uh, similar trends. But uh, uh, so, so then somehow the drone experiment, if you read it, your calculation, in that case, you should predict the opposite? Is that the expectation? If I read it, my calculation, I would get the opposite. I don't follow. Well, saying that, you know, these experiments with use a bilayer graphene uh, as your, as the screening uh, gate, right? So they don't yeah. find the destruction of the correlated and so there's a slight change of gap, but uh, no dramatic suppression, even though the screening should be much more efficient in that case. Because there you're not making a new device each time. You're just in the same device in C2, you're turning on or turning off the screening. And then the correlated insulator is still there. Right? So yeah, may maybe that's a case where perhaps if you read it, the theory in that case, it may be interesting to see whether you predict the opposite of what you predict for a all. Okay, it's it's a fair point. I mean, to be honest, I haven't I haven't I mean I've seen that paper. I haven't I haven't thought too deeply about it, uh, but uh, I mean I I do take your point. All right, good. Thanks. That's all. Uh, so Yasha Komijani has a, a question that's kind of related, I guess. Uh, in the data, it seems the um, superconductivity gets weak uh, with reducing the um, boron nitride thickness, and then strong again uh, in the D one sample. Uh, how significant is this with respect to sample to sample variation? Yeah, that, that's what I've been saying. Yes, I mean, there is some, I mean, we already know that, I mean, from, from the initial data from the MIT group, that sample to sample variation is, is significant when it comes to, to transition temperatures. You can easily get from 0.1 to, you know, 2 Kelvin. So, um, you know, it, it's hard to, to, to sort of ex separate out the sample to sample variation in this case. And um, yeah, it's a fair point. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I guess what, what could be said, and, and I guess something that uh, Efetov said at, in last year's conference, uh, how, many, how many samples are, how many superconducting twisted bilayer samples are there in the world? Uh, and the answer is uh, maybe 20 or something of that order of magnitude. So, so it's just not many, uh, it's just not many uh, samples around and each of them are slightly different. Okay, so. Just, just a little uh, note, uh, we are now at the hour or roughly. Uh, so um, we've got another 25 minutes or so of, uh, well, question time, but uh, Let's yeah, I have, I have five more minutes. Uh, okay, excellent. Uh, yeah, so there's just one final topic uh, that I wanted to show, uh, and then I'm done. And the last topic is uh, okay. So, so I was just about to to set it up, uh, and sort of uh, I, I've, to I've told you about these two camps: uh, phonon mediated superconductivity and uh, spin fluctuation mediated superconductivity. And uh, well, well, we'll see. Uh, well, they they'll probably keep arguing for a while. Um, and I'm not going to say which one I, I sort of believe more. I mean, what, what I want to do is uh, I want to sort of broaden the discussion a little bit and, and show you maybe yet another mechanism that can give rise to superconductivity. And uh, so we, we, we came across this mechanism more or less by accident 
uh, because what we did is we were studying uh, internal screening, right? So, so far I've told you about uh, the role of, of external screening, uh, but of course, you know, the electrons within the graphene also uh, have the ability to rearrange themselves. And uh, well, you, you, can, you can calculate this, uh, and we did this using the random phase approximation. You calculate uh, the dielectric constant, and to do that, you have to calculate uh, the polarizability, um, which is given as a sum of all transitions from uh, occupied to unoccupied bands. So here I'm showing you the polarizability as a function of wave vector and for four different twist angles. And you see, if you're far from the, from, the, from the magic angle, you get something that's more or less linear, which is precisely what you would expect from graphene. But as you approach the magic angle, you get a very pronounced bump. And uh, well, this bump is of course, just a reflection of the renormalization of the Fermi velocity close to the magic angle. Now, from, uh, so, so this gives us the polarizability and then also the dielectric constant. And from the dielectric constant, I can calculate the screen interaction. And here I'm showing you the screen interaction uh, as a function of position. So this is the screen interaction between two electrons. Um, and what you see very far from, uh, from the magic angle, so let's see uh, the, the blue curve, uh, basically what this says is we have a repulsive interaction, like you know, we would expect between electrons. Now, as we go closer and closer to the magic angle, though, you see that at some point, sort of around 1.4 degree, uh, the effective interaction actually becomes attractive between two electrons. And so this is a purely electronic uh, interaction. It's not spin mediated. It's basically a polarization effect. Um, now you might say, okay, um, I mean, you know, attractive interactions are actually not something new. Every material has attractive interactions, every metal. And the reason is of course, uh, Friedel oscillations. So uh, Friedel oscillation is of course, an oscillation in real space that is caused by the discontinuity of the Fermi Dirac distribution in K space. Um, and so every metal, when you calculate the effective interaction uh, from internal screening has sort of attractive regions. Uh, but, but this is not it, uh, because here we're dealing with a semi-metal, right? So this is undoped graphene and in a semi-metal uh, there is no um, uh, there's no discontinuity in K-space. So here we really wouldn't uh, expect Friedel oscillations to, to be observable. Now the reason, are, and, it, and it is in fact a different reason that gives rise to attractive interactions. And uh, the reason is there is a discontinuity in K-space, but it doesn't derive from the Fermi distribution. It derives from the discontinuous, from the discontinuous behavior of the band velocity. So what we know is that the band velocity is very strongly renormalized for low energy bands, but then for high energy bands, the high energy bands just have the, the unrenormalized graphene Fermi velocity. So it's this discontinuity of the, of the Fermi uh, velocity or the band velocity that when you Fourier transform it to real space uh, gives you uh, attractive interactions. And now the question is, can these attractive interactions lead to uh, a Cooper pairing, for example? Well, I mean, we don't know. We, have, we haven't done the calculation. Uh, I found it interesting uh, to, to see that actually, well, I mean, it, it is quite well known that um, Friedel oscillations can give rise to superconductivity. And this is precisely what, what motivated Cohn and Luttinger in, the, in their famous 1965 paper. Uh, so if you, if you read sort of the introduction, what they say is it's very well known that there is oscill an oscillatory potential in metals. And basically they wanna see if, this, if these uh, oscillations arising from Friedel uh, oscillations can give rise to Cooper pairing. And uh, the answer of course was, is, is affirmative. Now, the interesting thing is though, uh, when, when you hear about the Cohn and Luttinger superconductivity, most frequently you, you, you think about spin fluctuations, at least that's what I did before I read this paper. And, and the answer is in, in, in these Feynman diagrams, so, uh, so this is the Feynman diagram that, that gives rise to Friedel oscillations. So this has the polarization bubble. 
But Cohn and Luttinger, of course, realized that they have to be consistent and take into account all, uh, all, all Feynman diagrams at second order. And these additional diagrams are, you know, are, are sort of as those associated with, with T matrices and spin fluctuations. And that's sort of then what, what got well known in the context of, of the Cooper. But, but basically, uh, the bottom line is that Friedel oscillations can give rise to superconductivity. And so there seems to be a, a, you know, a reason to hope that these new type of oscillations that we have discovered could also potentially give rise uh, to superconductivity in twisted bilayer graphing. So with that, I'm, 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 I'm done Question. after all. So let me just okay. summarize very briefly. Um, so I've shown you basically the importance of long range interactions in the normal state. Uh, I've shown you that there are new opportunities to probe electron correlations in two dimensions, which are absent in, uh, th in let's say, the three-dimensional cuprits. We have to, I think, some experiments, e even though it's very debatable, uh, uh, and, and there are different experiments that come to slightly different conclusions, uh, we have to keep our mind open to the fact that, that these materials are different from the cuprits. Uh, and finally, uh, I've talked to you about internal screening and the possibility that this might give rise to a polarization glue. Now, the work has, of course, been done uh, not by me most of the time, but uh, by a very bright uh, PhD student, Zachary Goodwin, and by a, a postdoc in my group, uh, Valerio Vitale. Uh, I also want to acknowledge my longtime collaborator, uh, Arash Mostofi, who is sort of uh, an expert at Wanye functions, and of course, uh, Dimitri Efetov for a very fruitful. Uh, collaboration. So thank you for your attention. So let's uh, thank the speaker first and unmute. Okay. Piers has already gotten some questions in uh, in the chat. I'll, I'll, I'll ask it. Yes, um, you have this fascinating peak in the polarizability uh, function, the bubble, um, and it had a very characteristic wave vector where it was maximum. Uh, what determines that wave vector? And what is the associated uh, length scale? OK, so the length scale I can show you. So you see uh, these minima, they are sort of, uh, so, 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 so these little uh, stubs here, they, they denote the size of the Moiré unit cell for the different twist angles. So mm -hmm. this is a minimum that occurs within a Moiré cell. So we were talking about length scales of uh, uh, 30 angstrom, three nanometer. So, you know, a, a fraction of the Moiré length scale. What determines this peak? Uh, what, what determines the position of this? That's a good question. So it, of course it has to do with sort of, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of this more in energy space because the low energy bands are renormalized and, and the high energy bands are not. Um, and uh, I guess energies can be mapped onto momenta just by, you know, velocity times k. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't have a very, very good answer right off the top of my head. Um, I'll think about because it. Because it's clearly selecting some q vector and you'd like to have a physical feeling for where it's coming from. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, so, so basically, So basically, it's at small q vectors, right? You're, you're probing transitions. Um, you're probing transitions. I guess I'm, I'm arguing that at small q, you're probing transitions between the flat bands. And at large q, the transitions between uh, non-flat bands become dominant. I guess that, that's what I'm arguing. Mm -hmm. um, OK, thank you. I'll think about it. I hope I can cook up a better answer than this. <laughs> OK, so uh, there was a question previously that you said uh, you're going to defer to the end of the talk uh, from All right. uh, yeah. uh, I don't know if you can find the chat. Uh, let me find it. I think uh, Jung Soup can just ask yeah, it. Yeah, I'll speak up. So the, I asked the, um, if I understood library. Uh, when I decrease the uh, twisted angle, then the unit cell size would increase because the wire size would scale up. 
and then bandwidth would inverse proportional to the unit of size. So that's my naive understanding. And it seems that it's roughly true when the angle is larger than one or two or something. But it seems that there is a minimum around one and then the cost of a gain. Uh, I'm talking about the bandwidth cost of a gain. So is there a simple answer why it shows such kind of a positive behavior? Yeah, so, okay, so now I understand a little bit better. So, so the, the, the answer to your question is, uh, at, at twist angles larger than two, basically uh, you don't renormalize your Fermi velocity, right? So at, at twist angles larger than two degree, the Fermi velocity is the same as if you have them, uh, well, uh, it's basically, it doesn't depend on twist angle and therefore it's your, your geometric argument is, is perfectly fine. However, at smaller twist angles, the, you know, the, the interlayer interaction does renormalize the Fermi velocity and that's why your rescaling breaks down. Oh, okay, I see, thank you. Uh, any other questions? I can't see anyone with a hand up now, nor in the chat. Uh, I want to um, point out to the students that uh, uh, Johannes unfortunately can't make the student last session after this. Okay, so if you have questions, you, you should ask now. There won't be an opportunity later. So can I just ask a very general question then if there's nothing else? Where did you see these moiré materials going next? Well, I mean, uh, you don't have to be uh, a sort of <laughs> a seer to say to say that it's definitely going into uh, the TMD re region. Um, so I think that's sort of the next big uh, thing to, uh, and, and the TMDs of course have a, a lot of interesting, well, you have a much bigger material space of, of different systems and uh, you have new physics, you have sort of strong spin orbit coupling, you have interesting optical physics, you have uh, exotonic physics, you have sort of, the TMDs have sort of this intrinsic velitronics. So there's like a, a huge new uh, playground uh, that, that will very soon be very prominent, I believe. So. Uh, uh, we've got a few more questions now. Uh, Gunnar, you have a question. Gunnar? So the question is about um, these additional terms in the Hamiltonian when you project into the basis of localized orbitals, right? So here you just talked about the T and U terms. Uh, while last time you said they're also going to be activated hopping terms and uh, possibly longer range interactions and so on. Um, I mean, now you didn't mention them, but uh, do you think- Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Important? And if so, how important are they? Uh, Actually, yes, and uh, well, um, uh, I, I guess, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, people are arguing about it. I mean, uh, how far you, I mean, we have mostly been focused on, on sort of long range Hubbard parameters, and that's sort of the bet we have made. But then other people are focusing on uh, these, let's say, uh, you mentioned the electron assisted hopping term. Uh, that sort of Pacoginia has been uh, proposing to be key to the physics and, uh, of, of this material. But uh, from what I understand, uh, L. McDonald is sort of trying to uh, debunk uh, Pacoginia's uh, approaches. So, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's, it's not settled. And, um, yeah, and I guess yeah, so, I mean, there's, 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 there's no ultimate answer to this question. <laughs> okay, thanks. I mean, we we are obviously in the process of of, of broadening um, of, of broadening our uh, looking at these terms and uh, um, but but part of part of sort of part of the you know I mean the, the, my talk was basically anti-historical because we, we did the normal state uh, uh, later than than the broken symmetry states mm -hmm. and uh, I can sort of see that a lot of people in the community are sort of abandoning uh, these you know, emergent one approaches and in, in, in favor of going to the microscopics in, in favor of sort of truly sort of, you know, atomistic models because of these sort of uh, many problems that one functions have. So I think there's, there's, a, there's a tendency and, and we're all sort of also doing that to sort of, you know, truly do microscopic calculations where you sort of just bypass all of these problems. Mm -hmm. Right, okay, thank you. 
So there's a question from uh, Henry Sheehy. Would you like to ask your question, Henry? Hi, Johan. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I have some questions that I would have saved for the student talk. They're probably a bit basic, but uh, I was interested in how you were doping with electrons and you didn't dope with impurities. I wondered if you considered that. Um, yeah, so we dope. Um, so we, how do we dope with electrons? So we, uh, you mean, for example, in the heart rate calculations that we do? Yeah, and why did you choose to dope with electrons rather than impurities? Um, so this is because the doping in, 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 in the experiment is not through impurities. It's not chemical doping, like in the case of the Cooperts. It's, it's uh, sort of an electric field doping when an electric field is applied between an electron residue to push electrons from, from, from the gate electrode into the, into the twisted bilayer. That of course has the advantage that you don't introduce any complications associated with the presence of impurities. Um, so it's, it's a much cleaner system. Um, there are of course uh, still impurities, uh, you know, twisted bilayer graphene is, 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 is a relatively clean system. It always depends on your point of reference. Uh, but um, so I think uh, there, there's uh, impurities coming, for example, from um, um, the, the, uh, the, 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 the dielectric substrate material. You can have charged impurities in the dielectric substrate material that then scatter electrons in the twisted bilayer. Now, I think what is a very interesting uh, probability is to try to sort of uh, not, not view these uh, impurities and adsorbate sort of as sort of things uh, that, that are sort of random, but that you consciously put them, right? So you can, you can try to adsorb, you can try to, con con you know, change the properties of twisted bilayer graphene by sort of, you know, putting impurities in certain places. And there's a lot of reason to believe that this is an interesting route because of the sort of, um, you know, inhomogeneous structure of the material, there will be sort of preferred adsorption sites. And you can think that there might be sort of molecular superstructures that you can create on, on this material. And, and there's a couple of people already thinking in that direction that, you know, you, you actually consciously put uh, adsorbates or, 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 or intercalants uh, in, into this material to, to tune and, and change the, the electric properties. And do you have some idea how that might affect the tunneling spectrum? Uh, yeah, I, I do have some ideas. So, um, for example, I mean, we're, we're very, uh, we're currently working on uh, the properties of um, charged impurities. So you can put, so you can, you know, if you, you can, let's say, if you put um, a lithium atoms on graphene, they will tend to donate an electron to the graphene and you'll have a positively charged uh, impurity. And for example, in case of graphene, it's very well understood both experimentally and theoretically how that will uh, affect the tunneling spectrum. And we're currently trying to work out how similar or dissimilar that is for uh, twisted bilayer graphene. Okay. Um, can you give me a reference for that graphene paper? Um, so there's work by uh, Leonid Levitov. Um, the theory work and the experimental work is uh, there's a science and nature physics paper by the group of Mike Cromie in Berkeley. Thanks very much. But if you send me an email, I can send you the papers. Okay, uh, we have sent two with a question and then there are one or two questions in the chat. Yeah, hey, so, uh, yeah, uh, so uh, I just wanted to comment on this exchange with uh, Gunnar Moller. Uh, you know, I missed a part of your talks. So I'm not sure if you have missed this before. But, uh, you know, in this system, the bands are topological. So this entire question of one year and so on and lattice models, uh, you know, exactly what range of hopping, you know, those things are all sort of a dangerous route to go, theoretically. Right. So, uh, uh, yeah, so I don't know if you addressed that in your talk, but. Uh, um, yeah, so we had, we had long discussions on Monday about, about one year functions. And uh, yes, as, as I said, uh, I mean, uh, I, think, I think a lot of people are sort of moving to true microscopics because of the difficulties associated with one year functions. So what does true microscopics mean? I mean, like, like I presented for my, uh, in, in the normal state calculations, you, you don't, 
you just take all the degrees of freedom, let's say all PZ orbitals into account. You don't try to develop a sort of uh, effective uh, description. You just do a, you know, a truly microscopic calculation that doesn't throw out any high energy degrees of freedom. Yeah, I, I see. So, I mean, one could do that. Oh, one could just work with the band structure on the block play functions and to, you know, and work with interactions in momentum space. Sure. But yeah. still work within the low energy band structure and not keep all the higher remote bands. Sure. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, certainly. We can just work in case space. That's, okay. that's, I mean, I guess the point is, I mean, the reason why I guess uh, people like Wanye functions, and then this is what I discussed on Monday, is basically a lot of the strong correlation methods, if you think about sort of things like DMFT or uh, you know, quantum Monte Carlo, a lot of these, a lot of these uh, strong correlation methods are written in a real space basis and they exploit locality, you know, like DMFT in real space. So I think that's basically why initially there was a strong drive to, to develop one function because a lot of people wanted to use these established strong correlation methods uh, in the case of twisted bilayer graphene. Um, but I think there's also a, a sort of a move to, to, to sort of case-based methods or microscopics. Yeah, in fact, the inability of uh, to use the standard DMFT or other such methods is perhaps what makes this more even more interesting. I agree. All right. Okay, uh, question for Wang now from um, Ajit Kumar. Um, in the chat, is there any effect on magnetic behavior due to interlayer exchanges? That's uh, a good question. Um, and the answer is, <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. I mean, we're, we're currently doing uh, uh, basically these mean field calculations on, on the Hubbard level. Um, So yeah, I mean, uh, hopefully I can answer this question <laughs> next year <laughs> if, you, if you still if you still invite me back. I mean, there, there, what I will say is that there is a question. Uh, I mean, what I think is a very interesting point is this question of uh, emergence versus inheritance, which which this sort of touches upon. Uh, so there, there's a sort of two camps, uh, and one says sort of, you know, if you start with the untwisted bilayer, uh, you already have a very interesting system that that shows strong correlation physics. And if you twist that, basically, you modify the existing correlations, right? And so this is sort of uh, the view of inheritance that you, you know, your parent uh, system, the untwisted bilayer already has strong correlations, and then the twisted uh, descendant has the same correlations, but, but modified. Uh, and then the other uh, view is the sort of emergent view that when you look at the two individual graphene sheets, they are sort of relatively boring from a strong correlation point of view. And if you put them together, at the, at, at you, if you bring these two sheets together at the magic angle, all of a sudden you have, uh, you know, you have something special. So, so that point of view, you say there's something completely new emergent that wasn't in the, in the constituent materials. And uh, well, I, I think that's a sort of an interesting question that also relates to how you really, how you think about this material. But yeah, that, that's all I can say, sorry. Uh, okay, another question. Well, this is from Sam Carr. Uh, well, he's wondering because these are 2D superconductivity, uh, do you see, do they see Beresin's BKT kind of physics? Uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 do, I, I do think this, this is seen. Yeah, I mean, uh, again, I, I wouldn't pretend to be a superconductivity expert, so, uh, but, but, I, but I do think these, these words are being mentioned. <laughs> Sam, do you have any follow-up on this? Oh, no, just wondering, like most of the 2D um, superconductivity we know is actually layered, so the materials are sort of 2D, but the superconductivity is 3D. Um, I can't personally think of another example of a true 2D superconductor, so. Or oh, superfluids. Yeah, well, superfluids, thin film helium is, I guess, the um, yes. closest analog. Um, yes, and uh, yeah, so I guess on Monday we already discussed, I mean, I already uh, tried to explain that there are some, you know, discussions around uh, misinterpretations of superconductivity where basically experimentalists reported superconductivity 
for example, in twisted TMDs, but uh, there's no growing consent that uh, actually it's, it's not true superconductivity. So uh, it yeah, is. Well, a I think purists would argue that no superconductivity in 2D is um, true superconductivity, but I mean, there's always a, a question of length scales. So. Okay, no, I, 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 I take your point. Uh, yes. <laughs> So I think one, I think there could be some interesting physics one could look for here, which we don't really have many other opportunities to see. And I've just not followed the field very well. I just wondered how much, but I can look as well as you. Yeah, don't yeah. To yeah unfortunately, it's really not uh, not my 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 area of specialty. These kind of things. So yeah. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. No. 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 Thanks. That's curious. So uh, I'm not another question from Yu Chin Zhang. Uh, basically, do the upper layer PZ orbital and lower layer PZ orbital form a chemical bond? Um, no. So it's uh, I mean it's 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 thought to be a van der Waals material. So the the bonding between uh, the two is is is, uh, is thought to be van der Waals bonding. So not the covalent bond. And now we have a um, uh, hands up from Daniel Munoz Segovia. Can you uh, ask your question, Daniel? Yeah, uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so thank you for a nice talk. It was very interesting. And maybe it's a very naive question, but um, as far as I understood in the first part, part of your talk, uh, you had a hard tree uh, potential. Uh, have you thought about the effects of the fog term in this in this model? Um, yes, yes, yes. So we're, we're we're thinking about it. Yes, I mean fog is a little harder than Hartree, <laughs> just numerically. Uh, there there are um, there are a couple of of works that that take into uh, uh, fog exchange into account. For example, at at the continuum level. So so there's two types of fog exchange, right? So there's there's kind of an, an atomic exchange, mm -hmm. short range, and then there is sort of a long range exchange interaction between sort of these moiré orbitals. So, so there, there's, uh, the story is complicated because of these two different, what I would call types of exchange interactions, atomic and moiré. And uh, one thing I'm wondering is, you know, how, how do, what, what's the interplay between these two different types? Now, um, so the, the atomic uh, exchange is something that uh, we're currently studying sort of in the terms of like a, just an atomistic uh, DFT plus U or Hartree plus U theory. Um, and then the, the sort of moiré exchange is something that people have uh, studied uh, with the continuum model. So names are sort of Al McDonald, uh, Paco Guinea. Okay. So the, 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 the consensus is that the moiré exchange is weak but it is something, and so compared to the Hartree, it's a small term, but it's something that can be, even though it's small, it can be responsible for, for, for uh, phase transitions, magnetic phase transitions. Okay, thank you. Okay, I don't see any more hands nor in the chat. Is that true? Uh, yes. So, uh, and we are roughly uh, out of time now. So let, let's thank Johannes again for a great talk. Thank you. And uh, th this is the end of today's talks. Uh, so we restart in about 10 minutes time for the um, student session, is that right? That's correct. Okay. And who is going to be the um, chair of the student session? Adam Walker. Ah, okay, excellent. Hi. Hi, Adam. Yeah, so Johannes has to go. I think Rosa is hanging around. Yeah, all Adam. right. Well, it was very nice to see all of you again. Hopefully I'll see you soon, soon in person. <laughs> yes, thank you, Johannes. <laughs> thank you, Johannes. Right, take care, everybody. <laughs> Let's see, how do I get out of here? Stop share. Yeah, that's done. Okay.
Okay. So one question, is in the same link? The students meeting is the same link? Yes, they will stay here. Okay, okay, then I... Yeah, yeah we, we just, 10 we, minutes or so break first and then... Yeah, yeah, I just stay here, I mute myself. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good. But Sam, who is the, who is, uh, can you un, uh, identify yourself, the student who's going to help out? Hi, yeah, that's me. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, Adam. Hi. Adam, okay, good, great, very good. I'll, I will make you the host then. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Here's, as we have only one um, speaker today staying around, I don't suppose you could stay around as well to answer one or two questions if they have them. I'll be happy to uh, hang around, yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah, just to have a few more um, I'll people make to ask Adam questions to. At the moment, uh, so Adam is the host and... Uh, yeah. yeah, great. And unfortunately, I think this is also going to be the last student-led session. Because tomorrow we're not, we're just going to go straight into the uh, prize ceremony. Yeah, well, we'll need a short break. I've um, changed the timings a little bit on the web page. Yes. We need a 10 minute break between talks. Yes. And by the time we finish that, it's just people will be tired. We'll have been going for five hours, so. Um, there's nothing else and it doesn't make sense to have another session after closing. Right. So um, unfortunately it's the last one, but I mean, there's been plenty of chat throughout everything else. And I was also going to suggest on Friday after closing remarks, we just stay open to tell people to grab a beer and we hang around and have some sort of semi-moderated discussion. That's a good, good idea. Let's have a right. chill out session. Yeah, just to chill out and people will still put their hands up sort of to speak yeah. in some order so that we don't just have the same people and speaking over each other. But um, but somehow we'll try and Very keep good. the moderation light to go on and people can just give their reflections on the conference or whatever. I think that might be quite nice anyway. Mm -hmm. Did any body, oh, never mind. Okay, I'll ask later. Um, yeah, I think this is about it. Do we want to keep the live streaming on? I think student led discussion, probably not. We can. And have you managed to save the talk that. this time, Piers? Well, I, <laughs> I've got it on my computer, but I haven't dared to double click to convert it. Um, uh, but let us now. Huh. Okay. I don't, I'm no longer host, so I can't, I'm going to have to re take, take back the host. Sure. Uh, okay. Uh, became the host. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, and you can stop the live streaming. Yeah. 